सेकंड में रिकॉर्डिंग सॉरी जी सो प्लीज अपने माइक्स ऑफ रखेगा आप सबसे निवेदन है और आज की इस परिचर्चा में आप सबका हार्दिक अभिनंदन और स्वागत है और ये आज की परिचर्चा बहुत सारे अर्थों में अन्य परिचर्चाओं से अन्य वेबिनार से बहुत अलग है दो तीन कारण हैं इसमें एक तो मुझे लगता है कि ये शायद पहली बार है कि लॉ और संस्कृत का इस तरह का कोई डायलॉग होने जा रहा है और दूसरा ये है कि पक्ष ये है कि हम जो इसमें तीसरा एक पक्ष आकर जुड़ गया है वो है जुडिशरी का तो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन संस्कृत और जुडिशरी इन तीनों के रिलेशनशिप पे जो हम आज बात करने जा रहे हैं उस वजह से ये एक बहुत अलग तरह का वेबिनार होने जा रहा है और हम ये प्रयास करेंगे कि इस डायलॉग को हम कंटिन्यू करें और इससे पहले कि मैं आगे की बातचीत शुरू करूं मैं दो एक बातें और आपके साथ साझा करना चाहता हूं कि हमारे लिए ये पहला वेबिनार नहीं है क्योंकि इससे पूर्व हम तीन वेबिनार संस्कृत के पक्ष से कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन का जो एक क्रिटिसिज्म है क्रिटिक है उस पर हम कर चुके हैं लेकिन ये जुडिशरी कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन और संस्कृत को लेकर के ये पहला वेबिनार है तो मैं आप लोगों के साथ कुछ बातें अपने पक्ष से साझा करना चाहता हूं, शेयर करूंगा और उसके बाद आप लोगों का आज के मुख्य वक्ता रिसोर्स पर्सन से आप लोगों का परिचय कराऊंगा आप इस वेबिनार के इस टॉपिक को आप जो अपनी स्क्रीन पे देख पा रहे हैं अंग्रेजी में आप जानते हैं और मेरा ये भी निवेदन रहेगा साथ कि आप स्क्रीन के ऊपर थोड़ा फोकस रहे क्योंकि चीजें आप पढ़ लीजिएगा ताकि मैं समय को बचा सकूं ताकि बहुत सारी चीजें मुझे बोलने की जरूरत ना पड़े यहाँ पर जो अंग्रेजी में टॉपिक है वो तो बहुत स्पष्ट है लेकिन जब आप इसको अपनी भाषा में हिंदी या संस्कृत में जब आप ट्रांसलेट करने लगते हैं तो आपके सामने एक प्रॉब्लम खड़ी होती है कि जब आप अंग्रेजी को हिंदी में ट्रांसलेट करके देखने लगते हैं तो समस्याएं खड़ी होती है जब मूल संरचना सिद्धांत की आप बात करते हैं तो आपको उस जैसा कुछ शब्द अपनी परंपरा में नहीं मिलता वो विज्ञान के पक्ष में मिलेगा और चीजों के पक्ष में मिलेगा लेकिन धर्म के पक्ष में इस तरह की बात आपके लिए कठिनाई पैदा करेगी तो मुझे जो सोचते हुए जो शब्द मिला डॉक्टर साहब विशेष रूप से आपसे मैं साझा कर रहा हूं उसके लिए दो शब्द मुझे मिले एक है प्रस्थान और एक है पिटक पिटक ये है बुद्धिस्ट शब्द है बुद्धिस्ट इसका प्रयोग करते हैं क्योंकि उनके धम पिटक सुत पिटक आदि आदि आपने सुने ही होंगे तो जो बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर वाली बात है वो वहां से शुरू होती है और दूसरा जो प्रस्थान शब्द है ये बहुत रुचिकर है और आगे चल के मैं आपके साथ इसका अर्थ साझा करूंगा लेकिन प्रस्थान है जहां से आप आरंभ करते हैं आगे की बात तो एक तरह का रिसोर्स सोर्स जो है एसेंस है वो प्रस्थान शब्द को बताता है तो सोशो कल्चरल मीनिंग में और इसके फिलोसफिकल मीनिंग में आप देखेंगे कि प्रस्थान शब्द जो है वो आपके जो बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर डॉक्ट्रिन है उसके ज्यादा नजदीक बैठता है लेकिन चलिए उसको आगे लेंगे अब इसके बाद जो दूसरी बात मैं आपसे साझा करना चाहता हूं कि जब संस्कृत के लोग लॉ के लोगों को आमंत्रित करते हैं तो वो ऐसा नहीं है कि हम कोई विरोध ढूंढने जा रहे हैं या कुछ हम हमारा ऐसा कोई उद्देश्य है हम केवल एक अलग अलग दृष्टिकोणों को यहाँ पे ला रहे हैं और हमारा ये प्रयास है कि हम अपने ज्ञान का विस्तार करें अपनी दृष्टि को सूक्ष्म करें अपनी बुद्धि को ज्यादा संवेदनशील बनाए नहीं तो हम दूसरों की बात को स्वीकार नहीं कर पाते तो सबसे पहले क्योंकि लॉ की जुडिशरी की जो जितनी प्रैक्टिस हैं वो सामान्य रूप से जो है वो अंग्रेजी में होती है और अंग्रेजी का जो इथॉस है अगर आप वो देखें वो आई एम से शुरू होता है और रेस्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड है यानी कि एक बेसिक डिविजन आपको उसमें दिखाई देगा आप चाह करके भी आप चाहे जितने ह्यूमन राइट्स बना लें फंडामेंटल राइट्स बना लें आपको अंग्रेजी के इथॉस में एक कॉन्फ्लिक्ट इनबिल्ट मिलेगा और इस पे जब हम चर्चा करते हैं तो वो एक उस विषय पे हम फिर कभी चर्चा करेंगे लेकिन फिलहाल फिलहाल आप इस बात को ध्यान रखिए कि ये अंग्रेजी हमारी दृष्टि में एक कॉन्फ्लिक्ट की भाषा है चाहे वो कितनी ह्यूमैनिटी की बात कर ले दूसरी ओर इसके नीचे आप एक्स एक्सिस पर देखें तो ये संस्कृत का एक वाक्य सामान्य वाक्य है अहम अस्मी लेकिन इस अहम और अस्मी के बीच में मैं हूं के बीच में आप सारा ब्रह्मांड ला सकते हैं 
आप दुनिया भर का कोई शब्द कोई भी बात इसके बीच में स्थापित कर पाते हैं इसलिए कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में ह्यूमन राइट्स में और बहुत सारी चीजों में कही हुई बातें हमारे लिए उतनी उपयोगी नहीं कई बार हो पाती क्यों क्योंकि हम हमारे में द्वंद्व उस रूप में यहाँ पर नहीं है कॉन्फ्लिक्ट नहीं है अब यहाँ पर जब हम ये बातें करते करने जा रहे हैं इन दोनों संदर्भों में इस सारे विषय को हम देखेंगे तो आपका जो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन है उसके ऊपर जो आप लॉइन को देखते हैं उसकी बजाय मैंने यहाँ पे ये कॉन्स्टिट्यूंट असेंबली का ये सिंबल रखा हुआ है जो लोगो था आप ये देखिए कि आप कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन और जो कॉन्स्टिट्यूंट असेंबली का लोगो है दोनों में कितना फर्क है शुरुआत तो हमारे एक संपूर्ण भारत से हुई थी और कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन जब तक बना तब तक वो भारत विभाजित हो गया एनी anyway, अब इसके नीचे जब आपने अपनी सुप्रीम कोर्ट को हमने स्थापित कर लिया उसको लोगो जब हमने देखा यो तो धर्म स्तव जया हम तो उसका रेफरेंस तेरह बार महाभारत में आता है और ये सारे रेफरेंस दिए हुए हैं अलग अलग पात्र अलग अलग सिचुएशन में इस धर्म शब्द को प्रयोग करते हैं और इसके साथ हम ये भी देख लें कि इस धर्म को सामान्य आम जो समझ है आम जो रिस्पांस रहता है वो रिलीजन के अर्थ में रहता है जिसका मतलब हमारी दृष्टि में वन बुक वन प्रॉफिट एंड वन गॉड होता है लेकिन मैंने अपनी परंपरा में इस तरह के विश्वास करने वाली बात या बिलीफ वाली बात कभी देखी नहीं और इसी धर्म शब्द को जब आप और आगे लेकर के चलते हैं तो आपको काल फ्रेडरिक जो है उसके द्वारा 20 डिफरेंट ट्रांसलेशन ऑफ धर्म आपको मिलते हैं इंक्लूडिंग मीनिंग सच एस लॉ ऑर्डर ड्यूटी ये सब आप जानते हैं मुझे उसमें नहीं जाना और धर्म शब्द का जो एटमोलॉजिकल मीनिंग है धारणा धर्म की धारण जो करता है वो धर्म है तो ये एक बेसिक सी बातें हैं इसी बात को थोड़ा सा और आके देख लीजिए आप कि जब धर्म शब्द को आप अपनी परंपरा की दृष्टि से देखते हैं तो आपको कुछ एक मुख्य शब्द मिलते हैं सनातन धर्म जिसे आप द एटरनल अनचेंजिंग प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ धर्म कहते हैं फिर वर्णाश्रम धर्म के रूप में वंस ड्यूटी टू ए स्पेसिफिक स्टेजेस आप जानते हैं स्वधर्म आपका अपनी जो पर्सनल ड्यूटीज हैं आपद धर्म प्रिस्क्राइब्ड एट द टाइम ऑफ एडवर्सरीज फिर साधारण धर्म है जिसको हम सभी फॉलो करते हैं मॉरल ड्यूटीज जिसे आप कहते हैं और एक जो जिसको लेकर के अक्सर समस्या रहती है वो युग धर्म जिसको मनु खुद ही अपने पहले अध्याय के पचासीवें श्लोक में कह देते हैं कि ये युग धर्म जो है निरंतर बदलते रहते हैं सतयुग का और धर्म था कलयुग का और है द्वापर और त्रिता के अलग अलग और फिर इसी धर्म को मनुस्मृति और याज्ञवल्क स्मृति जो आप लोग कभी कभी रेफर करते ही होंगे उसमें एक मोरलिटी के सेंस में वहां पे धर्म शब्द प्रयोग होता है ओके अब इस धर्म क्योंकि हम सुप्रीम कोर्ट के कॉन्टेक्स में ये सारी बातें करने जा रहे हैं तो सुप्रीम कोर्ट का संबंध तो न्याय से ज्यादा है अब वो धर्म के आधार पे न्याय है या जैसे भी है तो मुझे दो बातें ध्यान में आती हैं और मुझे नहीं पता कि कभी हम लोग लॉ में इन चीजों को कभी रेफर करते हैं कि नहीं करते दो राजा हैं दोनों राजाओं की आप कहानी जानते ही होंगे कि किंग जो राजा दिलीप हैं उन्होंने गाय की रक्षा के लिए अपने जीवन को दिया देने का प्रयास किया ये उनका अपनी तरह का न्याय था और शिवी जो है उनके न्याय का जो रिस्पॉन्स है कि वो किसी तरह से जो बाज है उससे कबूतर को बचाना चाहते हैं और अपना सारा शरीर काट के दे देते हैं ये उनका न्यायपूर्ण धर्म को उन्होंने अपनी तरीके से फॉलो किया मुझे नहीं पता कि कभी हमने वेस्टर्न लॉज को ध्यान में रखते हुए या उस तरह की हिस्ट्री में इन चीजों को कभी हमने रेफर किया कभी कि नहीं किया अब इन सारी बातों को ध्यान में रखते हुए और अधिक फोकस करते हुए मैं आपको का ध्यान इस ओर भी लाना चाहता हूं कि हम लोग के सामान्य रूप से चार प्रकार के प्रश्न होते हैं परंपरा में हम लोग पढ़ाते हैं कि नहीं पढ़ाते वो अलग बात है लेकिन चार तरह के आपकी परंपरा में एक ट्रेनिंग है कि जब तक आपको ये प्रश्न करने की कला नहीं आती तब तक आप उत्तर के अधिकारी नहीं होते सबसे पहले है टेक्निकली एकांश व्याकरण जिसका उत्तर आप हाँ या ना में देते हैं आप पढ़ सकते हैं बाकी सारी बातें मैं छोड़ रहा हूँ कि भाई आप इस विषय पे हमें चर्चा करनी चाहिए कि नहीं चाहिए आप उसको यस और नो कर सकते हैं सेकंड क्वेश्चन जिसका आप लोग भी प्रयोग करते हैं प्रति परीक्षा व्याकरण यानी कि काउंटर क्वेश्चन कि आपने एक सवाल किया उसके बदले में दूसरा सवाल करके आपने आंसर दे दी तीसरी तरह के जो सवाल होते हैं उनको स्थापनीय प्रश्न कहते हैं जिनका मतलब होता है इेलिवेंट क्वेश्चन आप उसको इग्नोर कर देते हैं लेकिन चौथी जो कैटेगरी है आपकी परंपरा में प्रश्न करने की जिसके आधार पर आज हम ये चर्चा करने के लिए 
चर्चा करने का साहस कर रहे हैं उसको कहते हैं विभज्य व्याकरणीय प्रश्न विभज्य व्याकरणी का मतलब है कि जहां आप बड़ा एनालिटिकली लॉजिकली विश्लेषण करते हुए उत्तर देने का प्रयास करते हैं वो प्रश्न गंभीरता पूर्वक लेने वाले होते हैं जैसे कि सर्वोच्च न्यायालय के न्याय संबंधी जो प्रक्रिया है उसके राजकीय प्रतीक वाक्य जो यतो धर्म तथो जय का आपस में क्या संबंध है यानी कि न्यायालय और इस लोगों का आपस में क्या संबंध है और इंडियन संविधान में संग्रहित और संपादित जो विभिन्न देशी मूल्य हैं उसमें इस पद्यांश का क्या औचित्य है कि जब आपने सारी वैल्यूज वहां से ले ली है वेस्टर्न कंट्री से तो फिर अब आप धर्म शब्द को और उसकी जय शब्द को आपका जोड़ने का मतलब कैसे जोड़ेंगे कैसे उसकी रेलिवेंस बिठाएंगे तो इन सब बातों को जानने और समझने के लिए विस्तार पूर्वक जानने के लिए इन प्रश्नों को बड़े सरल रूप में हमने ये आगे भी रखा था जैसे कि व्हाट इट हैज टू विद जुडिशियल सिस्टम और जस्टिस धर्म का व्हाट इट हैज टू डू विद सेक्युलर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन एंड सेक्युलर वर्किंग ऑफ सुप्रीम कोर्ट व्हाट विच धर्म इट रेफर्स टू एंड व्हाट काइंड ऑफ धर्म इट रेफर्स टू ये सारी बातें मैं आपके साथ बाद में साझा कर दूंगा और ये पीपीटी भी शेयर कर दूंगा जो लोग चाहेंगे तो मैं ज्यादा नहीं पढ़ना चाहता क्योंकि समय ज्यादा लग रहा है तो इन सब बातों के उत्तर के लिए इन सब बातों का विस्तार पूर्वक विश्लेषण करने के लिए आज जिन मुख्य वक्ता रिसोर्स पर्सन को हमने सादर आमंत्रित किया है वो है आदरणीय प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर वीरेंद्र कुमार जी एल एल एम एस जे डी टोरंटो कैनेडा से प्रोफेसर अमेरिटस एंड फॉर्मर चेयरमैन डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ लॉस एंड ही वॉज डीन फैकल्टी ऑफ लॉस फेलो पंजाब यूनिवर्सिटी चंडीगढ़ एंड यू जी सी अमेरिटस फेलो ये तो उनकी उपलब्धियां हैं लेकिन जब मैं उनके एसेंस और फॉर्म के बारे में बात करता हूं तो आप देखेंगे कि एक्स एक्सिस और वाई एक्सिस के ऊपर दो कारण है जिसकी वजह से मैंने उनको आमंत्रित किया एक उनकी इंटेलेक्ट और दूसरा उनकी इंटेलिजेंस प्रोफेसर वीरेंद्र जी इन दोनों का एक अद्भुत मिश्रण है कमाल का और आप देखेंगे कैसा खूबसूरत उनका सिंथेसिस है जिसकी मैनिफेस्टेशन आपको कहां दिखाई देती है शास्त्र में शास्त्र का मतलब क्या है डिसिप्लिन ऑफ नॉलेज वो शास्त्र वो नहीं है कि आपको धर्म कर्म कांड वाला है दूसरा रीजनिंग जिसे आप युक्ति कहते हैं क्योंकि हमें अक्सर आदत नहीं होती अपनी भाषा के शब्दों को प्रयोग करने की लेकिन मैं अपनी भाषा में शब्दों का प्रयोग करके उसको अंग्रेजी में अनुवाद करता हूँ और तीसरा है आपका अनुभव क्या कहता है तो इन तीन बातों का आप जो सिंथेसिस इनमें देखेंगे आज इनकी परिचर्चा में उस वजह से वो साधर हमारे आदर के पात्र हैं प्रणाम के योग्य हैं और मैं उनका अभिवादन करता हूं और उनके साथ ही जितने हमारे साथ विद्वान और अनुभवी लोग हमारे साथ जुड़े हुए हैं लॉ के क्षेत्र से उन सभी का हार्दिक अभिनंदन और स्वागत करता हूँ इससे पूर्व की मैं उनको वक्तव्य के लिए आमंत्रित करूँ सर मैं एक दो तो बातें और आपके साथ साझा करना चाहता हूं मेरा लोभ है कि मैं इस बात को आपके सामने रखूं ताकि आपके उसके आप उसको दिशा भी दें उसको आप अगर वो अनुचित है तो उसको आप सुधारें भी ये सामान्य मेरी जानकारी है जो कि सुप्रीम कोर्ट और जिसकी अभी हम चर्चा आरंभ करने से पूर्व बातचीत कर रहे थे कि ये जो बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर डॉक्ट्रिन है इसका कहाँ से इस शुरुआत है और कहाँ इसके क्या क्या चीजें हैं ये सभी आप जानते हैं मुझे इसमें नहीं जाना लेकिन संस्कृत का पक्ष मैं जरूर रखना चाहता हूँ एक मिनट में और उसके बाद हम डॉक्टर साहब को बात सुनेंगे देखिए ये जो आ, बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर वाला डॉक्टर है जिसे प्रस्थान मैंने शब्द कहा है उसकी वो मेरे लिए कोई अजनबी शब्द नहीं है मुझे अपनी परंपरा में सबसे पहले ऋग्वेद में वो बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर जिसे प्रस्थान कहते हैं वो मिलता है क्योंकि वहां पर आप देखें कि वहां पर पूरे स्ट्रक्चर्स आपको मिलते हैं कि ऋग्वेद है तो उसके चार भाग हैं उसके फर्दर सब डिविजन हैं मंडल आदि आदि और फिर उसके फर्दर फर्दर सब डिविजन है तो इस तरह से जब आप बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर की बात करते हैं तो मेरे लिए वो कभी अजनबी शब्द नहीं रहा तो मैं उस दृष्टि से जब उसे देखने लगता हूँ तो उस इंडियन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन को मेरे पास देखने के ये दो पक्ष हैं एक ये पक्ष है एक ये पक्ष है ये पक्ष जो पहले वाला पक्ष है इसमें दो तरीके से हम इसको देखते हैं वो क्या है स्वरूप लक्षण 
कि उस संविधान का स्वरूप क्या है कि वो वस्तु का अपना उसमें कितने कंटेंट्स हैं कितने आर्टिकल्स हैं आदि आदि और तटस्थ है कि तटस्थ लक्षण का मतलब होता है कि थिंग इन इट क्या है इंडियन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन अपने आप में क्या है ये एक तरीका है इसे देखने का और दूसरा तरीका ये होता है कि हम किसी भी वस्तु को सजातीय भेद से विजातीय और स्वगत भेद से जानते हैं सजातीय भेद का मतलब है कि हाउ इट इज डिफरेंट फ्रॉम रेस्ट ऑफ द अदर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन कि भाई अमेरिकन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन से कैसे डिफरेंट है ब्रिटेन ब्रिटिश कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन से ये कैसे अलग है और विजातीय भेद का मतलब है कि जहां पर कोई कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन नाम की चीज नहीं है और कोई धार्मिक चीजों को कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के रूप में लिया गया है तो उसको विजातीय भेद कहते हैं जो इस जैसे नहीं है और स्वगत भेद का मतलब है कि आप इसकी एक एक गुण धर्म को अलग अलग करके देखते हैं कि एक एक जो उसका कॉन्स्टिट्यूंट है उसको अलग अलग करके देखते हैं कि वस्तुतः हमारे पास लास्ट में बचा क्या है और अंतिम बात जो अपनी भूमिका के रूप में मैं आपके साथ साझा करना चाहता हूं और उसके लिए मैं आभारी हूं प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर आर के गुप्ता जी का जिन्होंने मेरा ध्यान इस ओर आकर्षित किया कि अक्सर जब आप बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर डॉक्ट्रिन की बात करते हैं और जो सुप्रीम कोर्ट का वर्डिक भी है वो क्या है कि हम उसमें से बचाए क्या जो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन का सत्वांश है जो उसमें से जैसे सत्वांश का मतलब क्या है जो बेस्ट क्वालिटीज हैं आपके प्रियम्बल में है फंडामेंटल राइट्स में है उनको हम प्रोटेक्ट करें उनको चेंज ना करने दें लेकिन उसका एक दूसरा पक्ष है रजोश यानी कि वो सारा पार्ट जिसको आप चेंज कर सकते हैं जिसके ऊपर डिस्कशंस हो सकती हैं, जिसको आप समय के अनुकूल परिवर्तित जिसमें कर सकते हैं लेकिन एक तीसरा अंश भी होता है तमो अंश जिसे आप कहते हैं जो कि उसके विरोध में खड़ा होता है जिसको आप उसमें एंटर नहीं करने देना चाहते तो ये एक संस्कृत का पक्ष है जिसके आधार पर हम बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर जो डॉक्ट्रिन है उसको समझना और देखना चाहते हैं तो कुल मिलाकर के सर मेरा आप के सामने ये अपना एक पक्ष था जिसको मैं आपके साथ साझा कर रहा हूं और मैं चाहूंगा कि अब आप अपनी दृष्टि से आप हमारे सामने अपनी बात रखें और जो हमारे में सुधार करने की अपेक्षा है या आपको लगता है कि ये तरीका नहीं है इस सारे इशू को देखने और समझने का तो उस दिशा में आप हमें अग्रसर करें और हमारे ऊपर कृपा करें तो मैं सादर आमंत्रित कर रहा हूँ प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर वीरेंद्र कुमार जी की वो मंच पर आए और अपनी बात हमारे साथ साझा करें सर वेलकम मैं अपनी स्क्रीन हटा रहा हूँ प्लीज शेयर योर स्क्रीन सर जी सर आप अपने उस पर क्लिक कर लीजिए बस जी सर इट्स विजिबल I am extremely beholden to Professor Ashutosh Angirasti for giving me the privilege to address myself on the motto of the Supreme Court. Under the aegis of the organization and the associate organizations guided by him, particularly the Institute of Applied Sanskrit. Shastriya knowledge. I am indeed grateful to him for this privilege. I consider it is a great privilege because it has given me an opportunity, rather a two-fold opportunity. The opportunity to learn something new of a subject of which hitherto I had no. occasion to engage myself specifically during the whole teaching career of mine spanning over more than half a century 57 years now and secondly uh, this is a further greater opportunity that is to share my understanding 
and learning with a very distinguished group of invitees and other associates who have very generously responded to our invitation and to present before them so that I can instantly examine the legitimacy of my own thinking and understanding on this subject. With these few prefatory words, may I begin to say, begin by saying, that since I myself wanted to learn about the subject of which I had earlier very limited understanding, I therefore begin by raising the most rudimentary basic question at the very outset. And that my question is, my very basic question is, which is represented in the title itself, that what does Yato Dharma Stato Jaya means serve and speak for? This is the emblem of the Supreme Court carrying the motto Yato Dharma Stato Jaya. This is the motto and the meaning as Dharma, as victory. My first basic question is what is the pristine source of this Sanskrit precept, Yato Dharma Satoja? Arguably, the similar source of this philosophical precept, Yato Dharma Stato Jaya, is the great epic, the Mahabharata. I cited the verse on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Arjuna tries to shake the discordancy of Yudhishthira by saying, Victory is ensured for the side standing with Dharma. Researchers tell us that this precept of Yatu Dharma Stato Jaya has occurred at least as many as 13 times as Professor Ashutoshji has just extracted those 13 references. Now the critical question which I would like to pose is that what does the juxtaposition of Sanskrit precept Yato Dharma Stato Jaya, in the emblem of the Supreme Court, which served as the backdrop of the seat of highest court of justice, imply. I'm referring to the what is the juxtaposition of the precept? That it is something which is which constitutes the background of the highest court of justice. The philosophical Sanskrit edict. Yato Dharma Stato Jaya, Word. the emblem of the Supreme Court, now this is my answer, is a continual reminder to the occupant of the seat of the highest court of justice of the nation to protect, preserve, and promote dharma. For under the Indian classical tradition, dharma is the king of kings, that is, dharma is the sovereign. If it is so, then the basic searching question is where the Supreme Court is destined to locate dharma? In the Indian classical tradition, the prime principles of dharma are lying embedded in dharma shastras, 
and Dharma Shastra essentially refers to the Shrutis and Smritis, followed by the commentaries and digest, and thereafter custom and usages. Now this is how we understand the sources of Hindu law. Now are the justices of the Supreme Court obliged to visit and explore these primordial sources for having access to dharma and its principles under the model system of administration of justice in independent India called Bharat? Is the question I posed. Obviously, our answer is in the negative. Now, if our answer is in the negative, then where should they go? The answer to this somewhat big question is to be sought in the transition from traditional dharma shastras to the modern system of constitutionalism. In the modern system of constitutional governance, sovereignty lies neither in the parliament, nor in the executive government, and nor even in the Supreme Court, but in the constitution itself. Logically, therefore, it is the constitution that we, the people of India, assembled in the Constituent Assembly, adopted, enacted, and gave to ourselves on 26th day of November 1949, which instantly became the repository and prime source of dharma and its foundational principles. And it is these principles of dharma which the Supreme Court is duty-bound, both morally and constitutionally, to realize in the life of our polity by bearing in mind the inscription of Kyoto Dharma Statojaya. The transition represents the linkage of tradition and modernity in a continuum. In the terminology of modern constitutional law, I tend to equate the foundational principles of dharma, which are as fundamental as the laws of nature, with what has come to be called and christened as inviolable basic structure of the Indian constitution. My lament here is that in my own estimation, it is the non-appreciation of this proximity between the two hitherto prevented us to fructify the full import of the fundamental principles of dharma, which the Supreme Court of India is bound to protect, preserve, and promote by bearing in mind the cognate precept, dharma rakshati rakshita, emanating from the same great epic, Mahabharata, from which we have abstracted the precept of Yato Dharma Statojaya. In fact, I have just cited from where this expression, dharma rakshati rakshita, it is in a shloka, dharma eva hatovanti, dharma rakshati rakshita, tasmat dharmam natadyami, mano dharma hatovanti. He who sacrifices virtue is himself destroyed, and what he when he preserves, it is himself is preserved. I therefore do not sacrifice virtue, considering that if destroyed, it will destroy us. And what is the proximate? Now this is the my inquiry begins. What are the proximate reasons for non-appreciation of this proximity between the foundational principles of dharma? and the basic structure of the Indian constitution. This kind of relationship I find is missing, but what are the reasons for it, you see? I find there are two reasons for non-appreciation of this proximity between the foundational principles of dharma and the basic structure doctrine of the Indian constitution. I have coined two words to explain this idea. What reason I may call it peripheral? Peripheral being the reason which is somewhat apparent. We have not to go very deep to earth out the reason. And the second is profound, which is to be deciphered, as if it is to be read in, in between the lines. Now for the first reason, peripheral reason, 
this is reflected in the opinion of Justice Curry and Joseph, who retired from this top court in 2018 after serving it about five years, five and a half years, till it was 2013 and 2018. Justice Joseph vehemently pleaded for the removal of the Supreme Court motto Yato Dharma Sato Jaya, that there is, there is a Dharma, there is a victory, and deeply desired that the Chief Justice of India must consider the idea of its review, removal. This view were expressed as early as February 28, 2024, at a website called Wire. Now, what is the rationale for this view? The rationale of Justice Kuri and Joseph for the removal of Ponto Yadho Dharma Sato Jaya may be abstracted on three counts. First, the motto Yadho Dharma Sato Jaya, where there is a Dharma, there is a victory, bears the notion of Dharma, I quote, as stipulated in the Hindu fold, is not always truth and therefore does not deserve to be the motto of the Constitution of India. The truth is the Constitution, Dharma not always. Second, all high courts across the country have adopted the motto of Satyameva Jayati. There is no reason why the Supreme Court should have chosen to keep the dharmic notion, I quote, dharmic notion, which is but a set of duties. Third, the very presence of this motto makes a huge difference in the approach of the Supreme Court in justice delivery. Now, I call it a peripheral reason. First is, reason for his removal is that it is stipulated in the Hindu fold. To my mind, it appears that dharma is being equated with the term religion, which is only a very limited meaning of dharma. Religion is included in dharma, but it is not the only meaning which dharma, the term dharma bears. And then he said, because it is not always truth, you see. It may be true, it may not be true. According to him, the truth lies in the constitution and not in dharma. So therefore, that is the prime reason that he would like it to remove it as a motto of the Supreme Court. Now, second reason is that all high courts across the country have adopted the motto of Sati Jayati. Now, in order to understand this reasoning, Probably for this, this reason we may be deciphered from any textbook and we have to look at the kind of a jurisdiction which the Supreme Court enjoys. The function of the prime function of the Supreme Court is really not to decide the list, the conflict between the parties presented before it. The basic and prime function of the Supreme Court is to interpret the constitution. And when I say interpret the constitution, I mean to earth out the constitutional values. And what are those constitutional values? As I have shown in kind of a transition, transition from the Dharma Shastric traditional law to the modern constitutionalism. In this transition, Supreme Court becomes the repository of basic foundational principles, which are no other but the principles of Dharma. So far, the third part is concerned that the presence of the motto makes a huge difference in the approach of the Supreme Court in the justice delivery system. Probably it seems to imply that if the judge who is occupying the seat of justice, if, carries, if he carries with him his own dharmic notion, that is going to affect his own judicial decision making. Well, the same statement, if he is neutral, impartial, 
and he has got nothing to do with dharma, then his judgment is going to be more acceptable. My own counter cumulative response to the three articulated reasons of Justice Joseph for the removal of motto is as follows, I have just explained. The usage of the term dharma need not to be construed in a narrow pedantic sense of religion. It is much wider import, which is of course includes religious duties as well. Dharma is a repository of values that are relative to all aspects of human life and culture, and those values eventually result in promoting truth, unity, and welfare of all. These values become manifest in terms of duties, action. This is important. Duties of different kinds and of diverse natures. Duties of the king, duties of subject, duty of religion, social nature, religious nature, for that reason, any act which a human being has to carry out would include his own dharma to carry out that duty in a manner so that the benefit of all becomes the turning point. See, next, fourth, why the motto of the Supreme Court, Yato Dharma Sato Jaya, is at variance from that of the High Court, Satimev Jayate, the answer for this departure should not be difficult to discover. We need merely to recall the wider, exclusive, and comprehensive jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to explore and expound the foundational constitutional values that stand informed by Dharma. One more misgiving needs to be cleared. Why should we be wary of accepting a value if it springs from, I quote, the Hindu fold? In response, as if in anticipation of what is being said in the year 2024, I stated in the opening paragraph of my short piece on Hindu law done way back in the year 2006. Hindu Law Overview, it was published by the Oxford International Encyclopedia of Legal History, University Press USA, in 2009. I did this piece in 2006. It took about three years to come out in this. This is the first paragraph of my presentation there. I quote, Hindu Law has the oldest pedigree of any known system of jurisprudence, and even now, it shows no signs of discriptitude. This is how John D. Main eulogized the commendable ability and vision of the Hindu jurist and their grasp of principles and their seminal ideas in his preface to the first edition of the Treatise on Modern Treatise on Hindu Law and Usage, 1878. In fact. They have been published in multiple editions thereafter. But after Maine has left, we have not yet been able to accomplish that kind of an expertise. I think it is something, a tribute, in which he has been able to analyze the entire history of development of Hindu law through the, through the instrumentality of the Supreme Court of Justice. I'm referring to the Privy Council judgments in which they have analyzed the various principles of Hindu law. After more than a century and a quarter, an erudite scholar could not help stating that the value of religious legal system, such as Hindu law, should not be perceived as irrelevant in today's modernist society. He's a professor, Mensky. He has written a commendable book on Hindu law Beyond Tradition and Modernity, published in the year 2003. Well, uh, Professor Mansky is a student of uh, Professor J.D.M. Dallet at the University of London, and Dallet is considered to be an acknowledged authority on Hindu law. 
he is cited even after his demise his work is cited by the supreme court with great reverence my update of meski's observation made in 2003 professor varnat meski stated that the value of religious legal system such as hindu law should not be perceived as irrelevant in today's modernist society in my own estimation this is merely a modest value the foundational values of dharma as enunciated in the classical hindu law not only that these have not become irrelevant in today's modernist society rather these have become more indispensable and fundamental to meet the complexities of the emerging socio economic political world impregnated with the incredible diversities of all sorts on grounds of religion race caste sex place of birth and many many more imperative need i am just only citing an instance imperative need of adopting the sanskrit precept of vasudhaiva kutumbakam signifying that the whole world is a big family which is one of the foundational principles of dharma expounded in upanishad as a visionary solution to a complex problems of the tormented world this precept is extracted from the verse i am nija karoveti ganana lagu chetsa udhar udhar charita nam tu vasudhai vakutukam this verse is engraved in the entrance hall of the old parliament building what does it mean i am imputing a meaning it seems to convey that while enacting laws the parliament should always bear in mind that these laws must result in welfare of all adoption of vasudeva kutumbakam as the theme of the india's g20 presidency which was there from december 1 2022 to november 30 2023 showcasing throughout the year during his presidency how to deal with the critical socio economic issues including piercing issues of environment climate change health agriculture energy tourism trade and investment etc by bringing together civil societies from the g20 countries that are inherently pregnant with diversities of all sorts for the collective benefit of all this is the motto adopted vasudev kutumbakam one earth one family one future vasudev kutumbakam why it's adopted because it is a india's timeless philosophy of the global harmony a plaque with this inscription of vasudev kutumbakam had been installed in the premises of the permanent mission of india to the united nations at the un headquarters in new york embodying india's commitment to unity and global collaboration now what is the basic functional premise of vasudeva kutumbakam that has prompted us to adopt and showcasing the world that it is panacea to all the conflicting problems now this is the basic what is the functional premise of vasudev kutumbak in terms of pragmatic principles of life the philosophical precept of vasudev kutumbak is firmly rooted in its operational principle which is crystallized as unity in diversity and not unity in uniformity by no other person but by swami vivekananda the wandering monk of india the great exponent of vedant philosophy so vivekananda who promisedly took the indian philosophy of vasudev kutumbakam to the world's parliament of religion on chicago on september 27 1893 showcased to the world during her presidency in g20 now in his classic but highly pragmatic address at the final session of the world parliament of religion in chicago on september 27 1893 swami vivekananda 
expounded the philosophy of Vasudeva Kutukkam by exhorting the world at large when he reservedly said, and I quote, if anybody dreams of the exclusive survival of his own religion and the destruction of others, I pity him, I pity him from the bottom of my heart and point out to him that upon the banner of every religion will soon be written in spite of resistance. What we reject? Help, not fight. Assimilation, not destruction. Harmony and peace, not dissension. Vivekananda's prophetic exposition of religion as inherent in the philosophy of Vasudeva Kalakam, in my own view, has found a clear resonance in the fundamental right to freedom of religion under Article 25 and 26 of the Constitution. Our Supreme Court need to decipher the notes of this constitutional resonance in the light of Vivekananda's elucidation, which tells us that the place of religion in the complex of secular state needs to be secured through unity in diversity and not unity in northern uniformity. Not the right of freedom of religion be made subservient to the right of others on ground of equality and non-discrimination under Article 14 and 15 of the Constitution. I have adequately dealt with this issue in my critique of Sabriwala Temple case, which is now pending before the ninth judge bench for its final disposition. Now, this was my first peripheral reason that why there is a non-appreciation of the proximity between the fundamental principles of dharma and the basic structure of the Indian constitution. Now, I come to the second reason. Now, second reason, I call it as a profound. It's a profound in nature. That is, it is not evident like a peripheral reason. It is required to be deciphered. Now, this is the uphill task for me, and this is what I'm going to share with you. This may be elucidated in the light of my most recent critique of the Constitution Bank Judgment of the Supreme Court in Janhid Abhyan case, dealing with the 103rd Amendment to the Constitution on the touchstone of basic structure doctrine, which has hitherto remained delicately problematic. This critique of mine has been published by the General of Indian Law Institute in the latest issue, which, is, which has not yet been printed. Only a soft copy has been made available. It has been published, Reservation of Economically Weaker Sections of Society by a Basic Structure Doctrine under the Third Amendment of the Constitution, a juridical critique of five judgment, judgment of the Supreme Court in Janet Abhyan case versus Union of India. The judgment was delivered on November 7, 2022. What are the values of basic structure doctrine of Indian constitution, which in our own view tends to inherit the foundational principles of dharma, as has been stated earlier, while dealing with the peripheral reason, which the Supreme Court is commended now, what are the basic structure doctrine of the Constitution which the Supreme Court is commended to explore and uphold while acting on the precept of Yadav Dharma Sattva Now, this is the question I am posing. A rounded, resulted view of basic structure doctrine of the Constitution is that it represents, this I am giving you an abstracted view totally, that it represents the philosophy or the underlying values of the Constitution that cannot be stated in the form of a straight legal proposition as we do in the case of enactment of a statute. Since the basic structure doctrine deals with the values that are highly abstract, abstruse, and academic in nature, it requires an analytical understanding. Let me go to the constitutional genesis of the basic structure doctrine. It was propounded or discovered. I put it in a, in a parenthesis or discovered. I'll come later on. 
It was propounded by the Supreme Court in their 13 judge bench decision of the Keshwar and Bharti case, 1973, by stating this is the essence of the principle. I quote The parliament, in exercise of its amending power under Article 368 of the Constitution, can amend each and every part of the Constitution, including fundamental rights in Part 3, accepting its basic structure. Now, this principle. This propounding the Supreme Court has been hailed as the most historic decision in the realm of constitutional law. In the realm of constitutional law, not only in India, but the world over. This is the premises. Now, what are the reasons? What are this? The basic structure of the constitution turned historic, at least for two related reasons. One, the basic structure doctrine was propounded by the largest constitution bench of 13 judges of the Supreme Court, hitherto ever constituted in the history of constitutional law. Till date, there is no bench higher than that of 13 judges, that too in 1973. So, looking at this figure of 13, arithmetically, even arithmetically, there is no bench higher than 13 judges. But if you look at the substantive value of 13, for this you have to look at the 13 out of 18. At the time in 1973, the strength of the Supreme Court was 13. Now you imagine if the 13 judges are deciding one case what the other five judges were doing. In fact, I do, do recall when I delivered a lecture in 2007 on basic structure doctrine, one of the judges whipped in by saying that even the five judges, leftover five judges, were not doing anything but looking at the 13 judges, what they were doing in the court of law. Now, qualitative value of 13 today is, we have to decipher the value of 13 today when the strength of the Supreme Court is 34. So, value of 13 would come out to be about 25, 25 and a half. So 25 out of 34 judges. Now you imagine that what is the kind of an importance was given to this issue which was to be decided by these 13 judges. Second reason is that basic structure doctrine considered and resolved perhaps the most critical issues of public importance. I'm using the superlative. I'm not saying one of the most issues. I'm saying the most critical issues of public importance upon which depended the destiny of the nation. This was the most important question. And the question was that how to conserve constitutionalism against majoritarianism. How to conserve constitutionalism. Constitutionalism means a system of governance in which sovereignty lies, as I said, neither in parliament nor in the executive government, not not even in parliament and executive government together, and not even in the Supreme Court, you see. Now, this is the supremacy of the sovereignty of the Constitution. Supreme Court may be a supreme, but Supreme Court is not sovereign. Parliament may be a supreme in its own jurisdiction, but parliament is not sovereign. Critical question, therefore, is how come the basic structure doctrine, which is recognized as the most fundamental principles of constitution, and yet it turned out to be most controversial today, even after its long-standing history of 50 years. We celebrated the founding, propounding of this doctrine last year. We completed the 50 years since 1973. Even after this period of 50 years celebration, basic structure doctrine still continued to be controversial. Now, let me show you the controversy even today. It is the controversy, first, it is the controversy between the government and the parliament on the one hand and the Supreme Court on the other. Watch my words. It is the controversy between the government and the parliament of India on the one hand and the Supreme Court on the other. Let me show you. In the year 2012 23 this was the headline published in Hindustan Times. 
Apex Court basic structure verdict set the head president, vice president of India. And the vice president of India is saying at the 83rd All India Presiding Officers Conference in Jaipur on January 7, 11, 2023. What did he say? I quote, in 1973, a very incorrect precedent was started in India. In case, case of Keshwan and Bharti, Supreme Court gave the idea of basic structure that parliament can amend the constitution, but not its basic structure. With due respect to judiciary, I cannot subscribe to this. This must be deliberated. Can this be done? Can parliament allow that its verdict will be subject to any other authority. Otherwise, it will be difficult to say that we are a democratic nation." Unquote. I have highlighted the word that this must be deliberated. Now, to me, when I read this news, because Vice President, who is holding a constitutional office, next highest constitutional office next to the President, he has to he is a presiding officer of the Rajya Sabha. It is he who has to guide the nation according to the law. It is he who was addressing to the presiding officers who in the respective states will be guiding the proceedings of lawmaking according to law. So it was a kind of a statement which need to be debated. I have not been able to find out any debate on this count, what he said. However, on January 22nd, day after Vice President remarks, CDI says basic structure doctrine is like the North Star guides interpretation of the Constitution. Now here the Chief Justice were delivering the 18th Nani A. Palkiwara Memorial Lecture organized by the Bombay Bar Association in Mumbai. To me as an academic, this memorial lecture delivered by the judges of experience are much more important than their judgment itself. You know why? The reason is when he's delivering a memorial lecture, which is which are invariably always published, you see, they carry a great value. Because here the judge is free to take a holistic view of the whole situation. He is free. He is not, he is not bound, he is not constrained by the factual matrix before him of the given case which he has to decide. So therefore, these are to be read very carefully. These are absolutely philosophical in nature. January 28 is a statement by Justice Nariman, who recently retired then. He said, it is the government bounden duty to accept collegium decision in judicial appointment and the doctrine of basic structure. I quote, here is a statement which he has said, as a matter of fact, according to me, if finally this last bastion falls, that is judiciary, or what to fall, we will enter the abyss of a new dark age. See the kind of an importance which is. And he was delivering the seventh MC Chagla memorial lecture in Mumbai. See the consequences, what the kind of an importance which he has attached to this basic structure doctrine. That if this basic structure doctrine the basic foundational principles of the constitution. If it is set aside, if it is destroyed, what will happen? We will enter the abyss of a new dark age. How do I look at this sharp controversy about the basic structure doctrine as an academic? My own concern as an academic is to find out what is the root cause of conflict about the basic structure doctrine between the government and the Supreme Court? What is the root cause of it? You see? Then how should we resolve that conflict? Because for me, it is not enough to say that 
that there is a conflict. That's not enough. I must also say why there is a conflict. And having said that, if I can go further, that how that conflict can be resolved, that would be a wonderful feeling. So I have taken upon myself this twofold responsibility. My own response to this academic concern, it is reflected in my critique, most recent critique of the recent constitution and judgment of the Supreme Court in Janhid Abhiyan case, 2022. This was the Janhid Abhiyan case. It's a five-judge bench led by Chief Justice Lalit. They have dealt with the issue of constitutionality of 103rd Amendment to the Constitution, providing reservation for economically weaker sections of society by excluding, now this is important, by excluding scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and non creamy layer of other backward classes on the touchstone of basic structure doctrine. The five-judge bench is deeply divided. The minority of two judges has held that exclusion clause is not warranted by the basic structure doctrine. Exclusion clause, that this reservation, if it excludes SCs, STs, and non creamy layer of OBCs, if it excludes, then it violates basic structure doctrine. The majority of three judges has held that such an exclusion is in accordance with the basic structure doctrine. The majority court, for their opinion, cited my research paper, which was published in 2007 by the Indian Law Institute, in New Delhi. On the strength of this citation, the Indian Law Institute invited me to do a critique of the judgment and share my reflection on the basic structure doctrine with their faculty and student, which I did on January 31st, 2023, in a two-hour extended session. In fact, when my critique was quoted, suddenly I received a call from the director of Indian Law Institute telling me that there is a great news for the Indian Law Institute, that a paper published in 2007 has been relied upon by the Supreme Court in their decision making, and he instantly asked me to come as early as possible to share my thoughts and reflections on this judgment. So this is how I went there and I shared with them. Let me share the first, the two paragraphs of the majority judgment citing my articles are as under. Janet Abhiyan case, para 317, for Justice J.V. Pardiwala. I quote, I am of the view, as Professor Satya Pratik rightly puts, that the fundamental tenets or the core principles of the Constitution are foundational. They are the core of its existence. They are seminal to the Constitution and functioning. The Constitution retain its existence on these foundations as they preserve the Constitution in its essence. This is not to mark out the possibility of structural adjustment in the foundation with time. The foundation may shift. Fundamental values may assume different meaning with time, but they would still remain to be integral to the constitutional core principles, the core on which the Constitution would be legitimized, sustained. In fact, uh, Professor Sati Pradik has took up the statement from my analysis, which I did in my article. The language is of his own, but the thought, the idea which he has abstracted, he quoted the reference of my article published in the year 2007, quoting the paragraphs from it, which he has taken. In paragraph 218, I am quoted directly by Justice Pardibar. It had stepped my conclusion from the cited article, and I quote, Professor Virendra Kumar believes 
that there is a difference between the fundamental rights and the values that structure such fundamental rights. The views, the values have to be, have an overarching influence and says that it is totally possible to hold that violation of the fundamental rights in certain situation may not infringe the foundation values in their backdrop, unquote. Acting on this premise, it is held that exclusion of SCs, STs, and OBCs from the benefit of reservation given to economically weaker sections of society, even if considered as violation of the fundamental right to equality, this is important, even if it's considered violation of the fundamental right to equality, is not violating the basic structural doctrine, as the same is invoked to fulfill the larger objective of extending the ambit of inclusive society in a social welfare state. Now, with this background, I turn to my critique of Janita Biancis. My critique of Janita Biancis. My examination of Janita Biancis, I examined on the first principles of constitutional jurisprudence. It has revealed that it is the duality. Now, this is my finding. Finding as an academic that it is the duality of opinion amongst the justices of the Supreme Court, which is the root cause of the conflict between the two organs of the state, namely the government and parliament of India on the one hand and the Supreme Court on the other in deciphering the nature and scope of basic structure doctrine. In fact, fortunately for me, perhaps, I had examined this very question of duality of opinion to slightly in a different context, way back in 2007, when I undertook my critiquing of the unanimous judgment of nine-judge bench, constitution bench of the Supreme Court on I.R. Coelho case. This was the case, unanimous judgment of the case. It was led by Chief Justice Sabriwala for himself and on behalf of other eight brother judges, including Ashok Pan, Arjit Pasaya, BPC, S.H. Kupadia, later on became the Chief Justice, C.K. Thakkar, P.K. Balaswami, Althamas Kameh, later became the Chief Justice, and D.K. Jain. And did a full-length critique of this landmark judgment, which answered all my concern that I hitherto entertained about the nature and scope of basic structure doctrine. In fact, I did a first article in 1982, which was published under the title the proposed perspective of doctrine of basic structure, doctrine of the constitution. I raised several issues. I raised the several issues which Professor, Professor Ashtosh Mukher, Ashtosh, uh, he had just mentioned in his prefatory remarks, you see, that what is the basic structure doctrine, that is the preamble, it is Article 21, it is, it is, Article 14, equality, and so on and so forth, you see. So these were the questions. My analysis at the time was that in 1982, that if you start identifying the basic structure principles of the Constitution in isolating in these identified heads, then all of the Constitution is basic. So therefore, there has to be something more basic than the Constitution itself. But I could not locate what that basic was other than the Constitution. The answer to this question I found in, the, in my critique of 2007 in the Nine Judgment Judgment. And this, I delivered a, a full length lecture which was organized under the ages of the as Indian Council of Social Science Researcher. And I invited Justice Ashok Ban who was a member of the nine judge bench, he was sitting judge of the Supreme Court, and delivered a lecture under the title, Basic Structure of the Indian Constitution, the Doctrine of Constitutionally Controlled Governance from Keshwan and Bharti, 1973, to I.R. Koilo, 2007. The guest of honor was the Dean of University Instruction, Professor S.K. Kulkarni, 
a very distinguished social scientist. And it was attended by the judges of the High Court. Uh, I think they came to see Justice Ashokan in the first instance, uh, listening to my lecture, was there by force. Now, this was published instantly by the Indian Law Institute. Now, in this article, I mapped the history of basic structural doctrine from 1973 to 2007 through the perusal of the various constitution ban decision and then raised an inquisitive question. Now, this is the question which I would like you to bear in mind. My inquisitive question was, why did the basic structure doctrine remain practically dormant and non-functional with conflicting views of different constitution benches for more than three decades after the 13th judgment, judgment in Keshwar and Bharti in 1973 to 2007. You see, basic structure doctrine has been hailed as a historic decision in 1973. And thereafter, for 30 years, 30 years thereafter, nothing happened to this doctrine. This doctrine, as if it went into a dormancy, it became dormant. So I wanted to examine why this dormancy. My searching response was the conflicting views could legitimately be traced to the lack of comprehending the mystic nature of the basic structure doctrine as promoted by the 13th advent of the Supreme Court in Keshwan Bharti case. You see, basic structure doctrine is mystic in nature. Mystic in nature. Something which you can feel and perhaps you cannot describe, you cannot concretely show, you cannot make it manifest, but you can feel. You see, something like this, as I say, my hunch is this is something going to happen. How? Is it? I don't know. This is my hunch. This is something mystic in character. So what is this mystic nature? Now, I discovered this mystic nature in the Supreme Court judgment itself of 13 judges. What was this mystic nature? Six judges led by the SM, Chief Justice S.M. Sikri against six judges led by Justice A. N. Ray. Six judges led both for powerful group, you see. One was led by the present Chief Justice. The other group was led by the other three potential Chief Justices. Justice A. N. Ray became Chief Justice. Justice Bay became Chief Justice. Justice Chandrasud is the Chief Justice. He was in minority. Justice H. R. Khanna was just wavering. Sometimes he thinks that six judges led by Ray they are right because their proposition was that constitution is itself is the basic document. What is more basic than the constitution itself? The other said that, that their feeling is that there is has to be something more basic. There has to be something more basic. It is something hypothetical. This is something with a futuristic input, not in the present, with a futuristic input. There has to be something more basic. And Justice H.R. Khanna was, was influenced by this argument, by this philosophy. He said that if this basic structure idea is not incorporated into the Constitution, there is a possibility that the whole constitutionalism would be lost. That if it is given unlimited amending power to parliament to amend the constitution, then in that case, there is a possibility that this constitution, which is considered supreme, supremacy of the constitution would shift from the constitution to the, to the parliament, thereby constitutionalism would be lost. So therefore, this, this tingling feel, feeling in him compelled him, impelled him from within to join the sixth judge, and so therefore it became a 
majority. So this is how, but they could not spell out what the basic structure doctrine you see. This was this situation. Let me show you. Reference to this mystic, basic mystic nature is found, for instance, in post Keshwan and Bharti case. I let me quote you there. I'm quoting the judgment of Justice K.K. Matthew in a bench which was led by Justice A. N. Ray, now he's the Chief Justice, two, two years thereafter. He said, I quote, the concept of basic structure as a brooding omnipresence in the sky, apart from specific provisions of the Constitution, is too vague and indefinite to provide a yardstick for the validity of an ordinary law. See, two years thereafter, 1973, the judgment, this, this observation was made in 1975. What do you say? He's still dropping that what is this basic structure? Do you see a, a kind of a lacuna in this statement? In the statement of Justice Matthew, I have highlighted. He said, it is too vague and indefinite to provide a yardstick for the validity of an ordinary law. Ordinary law. The Sixth Structure Doctrine was propounded not to consider the legitimacy of an ordinary law, but a special law, and that is an amending act of the parliament. So I think that there's a kind of a discrepancy developed on this now. In second, I state another seven judge bench decision, and that too after four years of the Basic Structure Doctrine. And this was an observation by Justice Bake, who became Chief Justice. He was again in a minority in the 13th judgment. I quote, in Keshwaran Bharti case, now he's the Chief Justice. In Keshwaran Bharti case, this court had not worked out the implications of the basic structure doctrine in all its applications. It could therefore be said with utmost respect that it was perhaps, perhaps left there in an amorphous state which could give rise to possible misunderstanding as to whether it is not too vaguely stated or too vaguely or loosely and variously formulated without attempting a basic uniformity of its meaning and implication, I quote. See, I was wondering that his grievance now in retrospect is that basic structural doctrine was propounded in 1973 by a majority of seven is to six. He himself was in minority. Now my anxiety as an academic to know in retrospect is what prevented the minority court of six judges to raise a further question to ask the majority court of seven judges to show what is, where lies the basic structure doctrine to tell us. I think there was this kind of a debate was missing, which should have happened in 1973, which should have happened in 1973, which unfortunately has not happened. And therefore, for 30 long years, it remained almost in a state of dormancy. My critique of nine judge bench unanimous judgment of the Supreme Court in, in 2007 has led me to debate two basic findings where I did the analysis of this nine judge bench judgment. I admire of this judgment because it's a judgment, is a unique judgment, and I would say a unique instance of this judicial statementship of the Chief Justice. That how could he carry with him? The other eight brother judges, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. How he was able to accommodate the viewpoints of all the remaining, that is, and can produce a one single judgment, you see, unanimous judgment, totally. So when I examine my two findings, one, and this is important, that it demystified the nature of basic structure doctrine. I think the conflict was because basic structure doctrine remain in a mystic state forever. It was a mystery that needed to be resolved. So that mystery was resolved by the nine judgment. 
And second finding was, it invested the basic structure doctrine with a unique spirit of dynamism, resulting into its restructuring and making it a powerful ploy for protecting and promoting constitutionalism. In my critique, critiquing analysis, I have shown how did I arrive at the two basic findings and re demystification and dynamism of the basic structure doctrine. I would just only show you the two stages which are important for me in these two stages in the nine judge bench, which is important in demystifying. Is that nine judge bench distinctly located the centrality of the basic structure doctrine in the protection of fundamental rights by stating, I quote, statement, very profound statement. The protection of fundamental constitutional rights through common law is the main feature of common law constitutionalism. Unquote. Can you imagine this? This single statement constitutes a one single para, para 45, at page 75. Para 45. One single statement. No, I was wondering that there must be something something in this statement which the judgment has highlighted, highlighted a single statement occupying, occupying the place of one para. I meditated upon it practically. The protection of fundamental constitutional rights through common law is the main feature of common law constitutions. I wondered what is common law constitutions? Is there a kind of a constitution which has been created by the common law countries? Nothing of that sort is. And what is this common law? Traditionally, we said the common law represents the tradition of English common law, where the law has developed from case to case through the instrumentality of courts. But even it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. So, to my mind, this common law constitutionalism, it is referring to the cumulative wisdom of the generation of ancestors and some total of this cumulative collective wisdom was that how to protect the rights, how to protect the fundamental rights, because fundamental rights are given by nature, not by state. If it are not given by state, state has got no right to take away those fundamental rights. They are percolated. They are percolated. So therefore, it is this which has led them to identify, to, to narrow the scope of discovering the centrality of the basic structure doctrine. I take to the second stage. The nine has been distinctly located. The centrality of basic structure doctrine in part three of the constitution titled as fundamental right by stating just Read the statement with an emphasis. I said, I I admire the kind of a kind of an emphasis which the nine judge bench has been able to brought about. I quote: If the doctrine of basic structure provides a touchstone to test the amending power of its exercise, there cannot be no doubt, and it has to be so accepted that part three of the constitution has a key role to play in the application of the said doctrine. In a nutshell, what does it amount to say? It amounts to saying that basic structure doctrine, if in this whole complex of the constitution, if it has to be located, it has to be located in the chapter of fundamental right in part three of the constitution. Because in the common law tradition, from time immemorial, protection of fundamental rights is the basic prime responsibility which has emerged throughout the history. Now, if that is so, now, there appeared a riddle before me to be resolved. That if the very basis of basic structure doctrine is to be located in fundamental rights enumerated in part three of the constitution, does it mean that basic structure doctrine or basic structure of the constitution as enumerated in fundamental right in part three are just synonym. You see, the basic structure doctrine is located in part three of the constitution, namely fundamental rights. Then fundamental rights and basic structure doctrine are they synonym? 
If so, then there's another continuing riddle. Riddle was then how to reconcile the viability of fundamental rights with the inviolability of the basic structure of the Constitution. Now, this is the question. Can you see the because basic structure doctrine, as I stated at the beginning, that's the principle thereby the parliament has got the power to amend each and every part of the constitution, including fundamental rights, except the basic structure doctrine, which means basic structure doctrine is inviolable. But fundamental rights can be violated. And now you are saying fundamental rights have to be located in part three of the constitution. So therefore, does it mean that fundamental rights in part three are synonym are equivalent to the doctrine of basic structure doctrine. Now, the answer to this question, the nine judge bench led the nine judge bench in dispelling the mysticism that hitherto enveloped the basic structure doctrine and also reinvested with a spirit of new dynamism to fulfill the objective of social welfare state under the constitution. They had developed a Pin test theory initiated in for reconciliation, the right test and essence of right test. I would not go into the into the details of this, but this is if I were teaching a law course, I think I would spend at least about two days to explain this. But let me go to the essence of it. You see, the sum and substance of my analysis is on the basis of what I said that the Supreme Court located the basic subject doctrine of the Constitution in the foundational values of fundamental rights initiated in part three of the constitution by observing a very subtle distinction between fundamental rights on the one hand and the underlying value principles on the other. Logical corollary of this differentiation was that it led me to unfold the basic premises of basic structure doctrine and say that the violation of fundamental rights in the process of amending the constitution may not necessarily to be construed at violation of the foundation and values of fundamental rights. And this stance has invested the basic structure doctrine with a spirit of dynamism, helping us to achieve the broader objective of the social welfare state enshrined in the constitution through its much needed structural changes or amendment. It is this perspective of basic structure doctrine, which is often missed and not fully comprehended even today, leading to the current controversy between the government and the Supreme Court. In my critique of Janet Abiyan case, when I applied this finding to examine the constitutionality of amendment, amending clause six of article 15, inserted by 103rd amendment of the constitution, it has instantly revealed an untold story. Now, this is something which I found while doing the critiquing of this five judgment, judgment of the Supreme Court. Untold story, what did I find? I found that basic structure doctrine was not propounded by the 13th judgment of the Supreme Court in Keshwaran Bharti in 1973, but merely initiated what was already inherent in Article 15 of the Constitution, wherein the founding fathers of the constitution reconciled the provision of clause three with those of clause one on the basis of the foundational principle of fundamental right to equality, which is christened as now the value of egalitarian equality. Hitherto, we have been struggling hard. And here we, I include not only the judges, lawyers, even the academician, including myself, hitherto, we have been struggling hard to reconcile the provision of clause three with those of clause one on the principle of harmonious construction in terms of saying the latter clause is an exception or proviso to the former one leading to an unsatisfactory result. And we just hold for a moment. Clause one of article 15 that states shall not discriminate against any citizen on ground of religion, race, caste, sex, etc. No discrimination only on ground of sex. Clause 3 says 
the state shall nothing in article this shall prevent the state for making any special provision for women and children now this you are making a statement state is permitted to make a kind of laws exclusively on ground of sex are we not discriminating on ground of sex as presented in clause 1 so to this repeatedly we are saying that no, no, we can reconcile this on a principle of harmonious construction the principle of harmonious construction is that if there is an apparent conflict between the two provision they could be reconciled by reading both these provision in such a manner so that both could be given effect to the maximum possible extent this is the harmonious construction so therefore they said read this clause 3 in the sense in the sense of harmonious construction but when i read this sense by applying the harmonious construction i feel that it result it reveals an uncharitable result what is the uncharitable result uncharitable result is that if i apply this provision of harmonious construction by saying that it constitute an exception to clause 1 it would mean that state is free to make laws in favor of women but only exceptionally but only exceptionally exception mean but only marginally marginally in such a way so that the basic rule should remain intact so which would mean that you can if you want to improve the lot of women you may do so but only to this section thus far no further now this is not the intention to my mind i find the basic structure doctrine was there inherent in article 15 because the founding fathers must have applied the principle of egalitarian equality which we discovered thereafter much thereafter 1973 so which mean that basic structure doctrine was there inherent in our constitution clause 3 was there right from the very beginning it is it has not emerged like like clause 4 and clause 5 subsequently by amending the constitution as i would say so therefore this is an untold story which i had discovered winding embit of the inclusive society following the lead of the founding father in clause 3 of article 15 the concept of egalitarian equality has been invoked to widen the ambit of inclusive society by parliament through the insertion of clause 4 and clause 5 in article 15 by the first amending act of 1951 and 93rd amending amendment of 2005 respectively that empowered the state to make any special provision for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizen or for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes our plea in respect of clause 6 which has been included included by 103rd amendment to the constitution additional clause of 6 to article 15 203 amendment to the constitution in my view is merely a further continuation of the process of widening the ambit of inclusive society by empowering the state statement the government of the parliament of india to make any special provision for economically weaker sections of society the only issue that remains to be resolved is whether the exclusion of scs and sts and non criminal air of obcs from the benefit of special provision of economically weaker sections of society is arbitrary or discriminatory on the touchstone of basic structure doctrine uh, this is in fact is the plea of the minority court in this case including the chief justice in our view the exclusion by parliament on the touchstone of basic structure doctrine cannot be termed arbitrary in as much as it is justified at least for the following three reasons my first reason is the genesis of basic structure reveals that in the matter of amendment of the constitution the concept of egalitarian and equality the foundational value of the right to equality it allows the parliament the widest possible amplitude of undertaking classification whether by exclusion inclusion or both as long as the basis of classification has a nexus with the objective sought to be achieved and what is the objective 
the continually widening the ambit of inclusive social order. The second reason is the specific exclusion of SCs, STs, and non criminal layer of OBCs who are already in the avail of such benefits to the extent of 15% SCs, 7.5% for STs, 27% of OBCs. They are not deprived of their benefit in any way, say by reducing their percentage of reservation. To my mind, is perfectly rational and justifies ipso facto. To my mind, it doesn't need even any other argument. There is a third reason. As per, an, per the current critical thinking, economic backwardness is considered anterior rather than posterior. Kindly mind these, bear these words in mind. As the current critical thinking, economic backwardness is considered anterior rather than posterior to socially and educationally backwardness with or without subjected to caste discrimination as is reflected in the index of poverty by the United Nations Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, which clearly says that poverty is, I quote, the most severe obstacles to assessing their rights and entitlement, whether physical, economic, cultural, and social. You see, if we are considering this position after 75 years of coming into existence of this constitution, the background has changed considerably. We are not living in the same historical background now as it existed 75 or 100 years earlier. So now the emphasis is shifted. Economic criteria inheres in it all kinds of other, it has come to the forefront. That's what I said. It, is, it has become interior rather than posterior. It has become interior rather than posterior. It is this led me to make two submissions. My first submission is that we need to revisit and revise our conventional thinking about the very nature and scope of basic structure doctrine. In my view, the prevalent notion that the basic structure doctrine severely limits the power of the parliament does not reflect its true perspective. Rather, its core objective is to enhance the power of the parliament by simply instilling rationality in their initiatives of breaking new grounds for fulfilling the goals of social welfare state consistently with the concept of constitutionalism. Thus, it is not the basic structure doctrine which is bad. It is our own understanding about it is its underlying philosophy, which is shaky, weak, and feeble. With this underlying understanding of basic structure doctrine, my own feeling is that any animosity between the government and the Supreme Court, in my view, should stand dissolved. Second summation. I do foresee a possibility, hopefully, in not too distant a future, wherein, under the overarching principle of egalitarian equality of the basic structure doctrine, the government and the parliament of India may eventually go in for a comprehensive amendment of constitution by abolishing all such existing special provisions for SCs, STs, OBCs, EW, S, etc., and come up with a one single criterion on economic basis superseding all other existing criteria and thereby effectively and rationally eschewing the growing clamor for reservation on the basis of religion, race, caste, etc. Two summation leading us to explore my second reason, second reason which I have said, termed as the profound reason that for the hitherto non-appreciation of the proximity between the foundation principle of dharma and the value envisaged by the basic structure doctrine under the constitution. Now, what is by, how do I explore this second reason? And through this second reason, how do I resolve that controversy? My finding, the critique of five judge bench judgment reveals that the basic structure doctrine symbolizes 
the inviolable foundational values of the constitution like the values of egalitarian equality and judicial independence true clear there is no difficulty about it and we also learn from critiquing that the constitution values are analogous to the foundational values of dharma as the values of vasudev kutumbka involving the functional principle of unity in diversity and therefore more profound than the egalitarian equality egalitarian equality is a foundation and value of basic structure doctrine analogous principle is vasudev kutumbkam vasudev kutumbkam carries its functional value what is the functional value which is which i have indicated the functional value unity in diversity so therefore and secondly dharma rakshati rakshita invoking the sanction from within and therefore more profound than the constitutional value of judicial independence judicial independence is a part of basic structure doctrine but then all the time the question has about it that judicial independence judicial independence from whom from the executive government if you say yes from the executive government does it mean that there is no other sanction on judiciary our fundamental principles of dharma tells us that this kind of a sanction should emanate from within from within sanction in dharma in the performance of duty sanction is from within in the western jurisprudential thought you define right in terms of duty rights and duties are correlated where there is a right there is a duty where there is a duty there is no right whereas under the classical tradition of dharma not that we were unaware of the concept of right we were aware but what did we do we defined right in terms of duty what is your right your right is to perform your own duty your right is to perform your own duty now what is the sanction the sanction would come from within now this is a something which is an integral part of the indian culture if you want to test the validity of this idea go to the interior of the village where this modern law has not yet touched their basic sensitivities if there is a kind of a conflict say the charge of a theft and one villager says that he said you have steal and he said no i have not his reply is that all right if you if you deny you come to the temple or a gurudwara and say that you have not he would hesitate he would feel hesitant because why because he knows from within that it is he who had done the crime now this is the sanction this is the sanction from within so therefore my finding is that there is a kind of a correlation between the basic structure doctrine and its foundational principle and the dharma and its foundational principle in fact foundational principles are still still anterior to the basic structure doctrine our rounded conclusion now this is my final having thus said and stated it hardly need emphasis to restate that we should not feel unduly worried and suspect about the usage of the term dharma in the precept of yadu dharma stato jaya simply because it is emanated from the hindu folk i quote under the indian classical tradition dharma represents the cumulative wisdom of generation of ancestors and thereby unarguably becoming the paramount source of eternal laws for the benefit of all sarve bhavantu sukhina that all beings be happy and peaceful in all respects not only in number not in number the benefit of all not in number benefit of all in all respects this is the kind of a feeling which emanates from the mantra which is supposed to recite day and day out having said this maybe the lingering reason for non appreciation of proximity between the eternal values of dharma and inviolable values as envisaged under the basic structure doctrine has been due to some structural deficit is it why this why this duality i i believe that there is a structural deficit what is the structural deficit i tend to identify such a deficit primarily 
in the absence of the corresponding term for dharma in english which is religion and which is not capable of carrying the comprehensive character of dharma and its sarvabhavik universal philosophy to promote the interest of all as we are witnessing in the construction of secular state under the indian constitution maybe such an absence would be traced to a cognate reason of cultural differentiation what is this indian culture is intrinsically holistic in nature whereas the western cons- constitution is strongly specific obviating the need for coining the term in english which would be analogous to the term of dharma thank you very much for your listening धन्यवाद थैंक यू सो मच सर सॉरी uh, uh, मेरा माइक ऑफ हो गया था तो मैं इस बात के लिए आपका बहुत बहुत आभारी हूं कि आपने जिस तरह का ये विषय हमारे सामने प्रतिपादित किया और जिस तरह का निष्कर्ष आपने दिया है वो बहुत उचित था न्याय संगत था और वही शायद अपेक्षित भी था भारतीय परंपरा और भारतीय ज्ञान की दृष्टि से और आपके अभिभाषण के दौरान मैं यही सारा विचार कर रहा था अपनी परंपरा के साथ उसकी तुलना करने की कोशिश कर रहा था कि भारतीय परंपरा में जितने भी संप्रदाय हैं वो अपने बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर को तो इंटैक्ट रखते हैं लेकिन उस संप्रदाय के सब संप्रदाय सब सेक्ट्स जो सब सेक्ट्स जो हैं वो बहुत सारे होते चले जाते हैं इंटरप्रिटेशन बदलती जाती है लेकिन कोर स्ट्रक्चर जो है वो हमेशा वही रहा है और वो कोर स्ट्रक्चर का भी कोर स्ट्रक्चर जैसा कि आप पूछ रहे थे तो मुझे लगता है वो पुरुषार्थ रहा है जिसका हम जनरली फंडामेंटल राइट्स में जिक्र नहीं करते लेकिन अगर आप कोर स्ट्रक्चर में पुरुषार्थ को ले आते हैं तो मुझे लगता है कि इस सारे इशू को समझने में सुलझाने में हमें आसानी हो सकती है और एक जो विषय मेरे और ध्यान में आया कि इसके साथ एक जो शब्द हमें प्रयोग करना चाहिए था मतलब भारतीय दृष्टिकोण से मैं लॉ की दृष्टि से नहीं कह रहा कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन वो था सम्यक बुद्धिज्म से लिया हुआ जो सम्यक शब्द है अप्रोप्रिएटनेस कि हर चीज में वो आपको अप्रोप्रिएटनेस के लिए कह रहे हैं सम्यक ज्ञान सम्यक कर्म सम्यक कि अगर वो हमें आ जाता है तो मुझे लगता है कि फिर हमें ये सवाल हमारे लिए को बहुत महत्व का नहीं रह जाएगा कि इसका जो बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर है वो क्या है तो क्योंकि अगर सम्यकता है अप्रोप्रिएटनेस है आपके एक्शंस में आपके ज्ञान में आपके सभी पक्षों में तो फिर ये इशू नहीं उठेंगे ये इशू तभी उठते हैं जब हम ओवर इंटेलेक्चुअलाइज करते हैं और कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन को हमने ओवर इंटेलेक्चुअलाइज कर दिया है वो एक इंटेलेक्चुअल एक्सरसाइज रही जहां पर मुझे लगता है कि ये हमारा अपना जो भारतीय संदर्भ होना चाहिए था वो शायद मिसिंग है लेकिन 
धन्यवाद के लिए मेरे पास पर्याप्त शब्द नहीं है वो मैं अभी बाद में भी करूंगा और बहुत सारे मेरे भी मन में और बहुत सारे पक्ष सामने आते हैं वो आपसे चर्चा करूंगा लेकिन जैसे हमारी परंपरा रही है कि अभिभाषण के बाद कई सारे जो प्रश्न है असहमतियां हैं टिप्पणियां हैं उनको हम आमंत्रित करते हैं तो सबसे पहले डॉक्टर रवि शर्मा जी मेरे सामने जिन्होंने हाथ खड़ा किया है उसके बाद प्रोफेसर सुधीर हैं और सुभाष जादू जी हैं कश्मीर से तो सर नमस्कार थैंक यू आशुतोष जी सबसे पहले आपको धन्यवाद कि इतने बढ़िया वक्ता को आपने ढूंढ लिया और हमारे सम्मुख हमारा आ, हमको आभारी बना दिया कि हम बहुत बहुत उनकी प्रशंसा करें और सच्चाई बोलें तो इतना बढ़िया आपने न्याय के दृष्टि से कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के दृष्टि से अपनी संस्कृति की दृष्टि से और और भी वेस्ट से कंपैरिजन की दृष्टि से जो इतना बढ़िया आपने अभिभाषण किया है मैं तो ये सोच रहा था कि हम लोग महाभारत की और उस डेफिनेशन से चालू करेंगे और मैं संस्कृत में जो धर्म की परिभाषा है उस पर जाएंगे लेकिन कई बार आकस्मिक और बहुत अच्छी अनुभूति नई दिशा मिलने से होती है वो आपने दिलाई कि न्याय का क्या पक्ष है अपनी सुप्रीम कोर्ट क्या सोचती है और पार्लियामेंट सुप्रीम कोर्ट और गवर्नमेंट का ये जो ट्राई पार्ट है ट्राई पार्ट राइट पार्टनरशिप है वो आपने बहुत अच्छी तरह किया और मैं बहुत खुश था जब तक मैं देख रहा था वो लुप्त हो गए हैं भान जी अशोक भान मैंने राइट वर्ड बोला करेक्ट बोला या नहीं अशोक जी भान हमारे बीच में थे और अभी भी उम्मीद करता हूँ कम से कम सुन रहे होंगे ही बींग जज ही बींग पार्टी टू सम ऑफ योर प्रेजेंटेशन उनका मौजूद होना और इंटरेस्टेड होना इसको सुनने में बहुत बड़ी गौरव की बात है और उसको भी मैं धन्यवाद देता हूँ अब मेरे आपसे दो तीन प्रश्न हैं और कमेंट्स भी हैं तो सबसे पहला तो ये है कि जो कंक्लूजन आपने नंबर टू पे आके पहुंचा था वो मैं पहले ही लिख चुका था मेरे क्वेश्चंस की लिस्ट पे तो जब मैंने आपका सेकंड वाला देखा टुवर्ड्स दी एंड तो मैंने कहा मैं भी यही कह रहा हूँ कि द मीनिंग ऑफ एस देखिए पिछहत्तर वर्ष में बहुत कुछ हो गया इकोनॉमिक अपटर्न डाउन टर्न हमारे यहाँ कई शेड्यूल कास्ट कई बैकवर्ड कई प्रिफरेंशियल क्लास के लोग इतने रिच हो गए कि अब उनको इकोनॉमिकली वीकर सेक्शन अन्याय होगा जो एक्चुअली इकोनॉमिक वीकर है इस बीच में क्या है कि कई सो कॉल्ड हिस्टोरिकली वेरी संपन्न कम्युनिटीज थी वो भी कॉम्प्रोमाइज हो गई है और कहीं कहीं मैं फेयरनेस में ये भी बोलूंगा कि फॉर वॉट एवर रीजन्स हिस्टोरिक रीजन्स कुछ माइनॉरिटीज uh, भी वीकर uh, इकोनॉमिकली होती जा रहे हैं कुछ उनके कर्म uh, कुछ और और कई कारण है तो आज हम इंडिया की एक स्नैपशॉट अगर लेंगे तो द इकोनॉमिक्स ऑफ 1947 फोर्टी सेवन हैज लॉट ऑफ चेंजेस स्पेशली एज वी बिकम नंबर फाइव एंड नंबर थ्री इकोनॉमी ऑफ द वर्ल्ड the income distribution of people has changed so one criteria would be economic weaker section identification usko aap identify kaise karenge there are two things from science you can get to help you one is obviously a good sampling and number two is good determination of statistics at the level of what dr mahal novis and people like that have proposed dr rao and others so we are ready as technical people mathematics people and so on to help you determine what you call economic weaker section the second question i have is even if you were able to determine only those people will come on your radar who actually want to come in on the radar 
जो बेचारे गांव वाले हैं कुछ कुछ मिस हो जाएंगे ना तो दे डोंट नो हाउ टू एक्सेस इकोनॉमिक रिसोर्सेज तो आपके अनाज पड़ा हुआ सड़ रहा है और लोग भूखे मर रहे हैं इन इक्वालिटी ऑफ एबिलिटी टू डिस्ट्रीब्यूट रिसोर्सेज इज ऑल्सो एन पैरामीटर दैट गोज इन डिटर्मिनिंग इकोनॉमिकल सेक्शन ये मैंने इतना सा कह दिया एक क्लास स्पष्ट आपसे ये है कि फंडामेंटल राइट्स आर बाय इम्प्लीकेशन जैसे मैंने जस्टिस रंगनाथ मिश्र से पूछा था कि राइट टू एजुकेशन इज ए फंडामेंटल राइट और नॉट एंड ही सेड डॉक्टर साहब आप ट्राई कीजिए नो बडी एज टेस्टेड दिस हाइपोथेसिस एंड आई सेड इफ आई एम रिच एन उस जमाने में सरकार ही एजुकेशन डिटरमिन करती थी प्राइवेट लोग नहीं करते थे ये आज से बीस तीस वर्ष पहले की बात है तो उन्होंने कहा यू टेस्ट इट इफ आई सेड इफ आई एम रिच एन टू स्टार्ट ए यूनिवर्सिटी कैन आई नॉट बी ए स्टूडेंट इन दैट यूनिवर्सिटी बिकॉज आई स्टार्टेड दैट यूनिवर्सिटी ही सेड यू कैन ट्राई इट इज योर फंडामेंट राइट इट्स नॉट इन स्क्राइब बट इट इज सेकेंड लास्ट लास्ट the last and then i will stop the last point i want to make is if uh, if the constitution is a living entity so pata hai hum who can amend it are the people of parliament so sir ji ban gayi once allowed to amend the constitution therefore they can they can they then change what you consider as fundamental rights and what will stop them from doing it how will stop them from running away from basic ethos bas yes. yes. stop thank you sir thank you so much i think you should okay sir respond to it <laughs> there is very many issues one of the issues to which i would like to respond relating to the fundamental right to education which is which is central but which will obviate the other confusions right the founding fathers of the constitution place this right under the directive principle of state policy that state shall within a period of 10 years provide free and compulsory education it was not a fundamental right it was a principle of direct principle now to my mind i think we have not understood the correlation between part 3 and part 4 if it is because in direct principle of state policy we say that though these principles are fundamental in nature they are not enforceable in a court of law yet they are fundamental for the enforcement the, the state is supposed to enforce these enforce these right meaning thereby and this is the issue which was which you were dealing with in relation to the economic criteria and that is that in case of education the state was put into the position of a patria potesta in the position of a, a guardian and also the executor of that right it is the responsibility of the state because you have very rightly said that if you say that these economic benefits are available but how the people who are in village who have no idea what those how are these channel what are those profits how to assess them it is the state responsibility to identify them and then bring them to right in fact the reservation policy this is the basic flaw to begin with it was there to remove a certain kind of an handicap but how that handicap is to be removed it was to be removed by the state itself to provide all that to create all these kinds of an opportunity so therefore it is the question of a basic understanding between even the relationship between the fundamental right on the one hand and direct principle of state policy it needs to be clarified if we go for this kind of a detail and discussion i think very many misgivings would stand resolved जी थैंक यू सर थैंक यू हाँ प्रोफेसर सुधीर कुमार नमस्कार प्रोफेसर वीरेंद्र जी नमस्कार रमाकांत जी प्रोफेसर अंग्रेश जी 
और सभा में उपस्थित सभी विद्वानों को ऐसा अद्भुत व्याख्यान सुनने का मुझे सौभाग्य प्राप्त हुआ मुझे सर की क्लासेस में भी मैं बैठा हूँ लेक्चर्स में भी बैठा हूँ एंड एवरी टाइम आई हैपन टू बी देयर आई फेल्ट माई सेल्फ टू बी ए स्टूडेंट नॉट ए स्टूडेंट ऑफ लॉ लेकिन जो शिष्य भाव होता है जो सीखने का भाव होता है आज भी आपके मेसमराइजिंग लेक्चर ने इट वॉज ऑल एन कम्पासिंग आई कुड नेवर इमेजिन दैट ए हाईली टेक्निकल लेक्चर ऑन ए हाईली टेक्निकल सब्जेक्ट दैट इज द बेसिक स्ट्रक्चरल डॉक्ट्रिन ऑफ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन ऑफ इंडिया कुड बी डिलीवर्ड सो फ्लुएंटली सो कॉम्प्रीहेंसिबली एंड कवरिंग दोज कॉम्प्लेक्स एरियाज विच आर जनरली लेफ्ट अनकवर्ड इन सो मेनी एकेडमिक डिस्कशन सो सर Uh, we owe it to you for opening up our eyes and enlightening us from so many perspectives do baatein sir main aur ek jo aapne bhi sir apne bhashan mein bar bar kaha ki because of this the textuality because of the taxonomy of the term dharma it could not properly understood by the either the western jurists or western academics or even the indian acolytes ऑफ दी वेस्टर्न जूरिस्पोडेंस जो कि बहुत संख्या में है भारत में आप जैसे जूरिस्ट तो बहुत कम है सर बहुत कम है सर मोस्ट ऑफ देम आर दी एक्लाइट्स एक्लाइट्स का मतलब होता है कि चेले हैं किसके हैं वेस्टर्न जूरिस्पोडेंस के ना लुक एट द टर्म कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन एंड संविधान जो अभी आशुतोष जी कह रहे थे अगर इस पर ही ध्यान दे लिया होता कोई जरूरत नहीं है सम्यक धर्म कहने की न सम्यक कर्तव्य कहने की न अननेसेसरली एडिंग द एडजेक्टिव सम्यक बिकॉज संविधान इफ इट इज संस्कृति लुक एट दिस यूज ऑफ सम ना लुक एट द रेंज ऑफ मीनिंग्स एंजेंडर्ड बाई दिस 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 यूज दिस डेलीबरेट सेल्फ कॉन्शियस यूज ऑफ संविधान विधान हो सकता है बट क्या वो संविधान है अब सम के अर्थ देखिए सो सो माई पॉइंट इज इट इज नॉट ए क्वेश्चन ऑफ सीमेंटिक्स ये सीमेंटिक्स नहीं है इसके साथ जो सर ने कहा कि धर्म कम्स फ्रॉम विद इन एंड दैट्स व्हाई धर्म इज होलिस्टिक दैट्स व्हाई धर्म इज ऑल एंड कंपासिंग एंड धर्म इन इन इट इज ओनली पॉसिबल इन धर्म दैट द व्यष्टि समष्टि एंड परमेष्टि ऑल एनवलप्ड इन सम काइंड ऑफ कॉस्मिक लॉ जिसे हम वो भी धर्म है हमारे यहां उसके लिए रित भी शब्द हम प्रयोग करते हैं तो जो फिलोसफी ऑफ लॉ है सर उसमें अभी बहुत काम होना है जो मैं सर से समझ पाया हूँ सर हैज बीन वर्किंग वर्किंग आई मीन से सो सो पेंस्टेकिंगली ऑन ऑन रीआर्टिकुलेटिंग द फिलोसफी ऑफ लॉ देखिए लॉ का अर्थ न्याय भी है ये ध्यान रहे यू डोंट हैव टू यूज एन एक्स्ट्रा टर्म टू डेजिग्नेट न्याय अपार्ट फ्रॉम धर्म सो धर्म बिकम्स द बेसिक फंडामेंटल डॉक्ट्रिन ऑफ न्याय Now look another look at another term niti now niti is dharma niti you translate in english as policy now policy is for police look at the roman meaning of policy for policia for police that is the urban ye dhyan ye bahut dhyan dene ki baat hai ki bharat mein citizenship nahi hai bharatiya darshan mein bharatiya darshan mein ye ye ek bhinn baat hai hamare yahan praja ka darshan hai hamare yahan jan ka darshan hai है ना अब सर आपने पॉलिसी भी धर्म तो नीति नीति इज ए कॉग्नेट टर्म टू धर्म आप अगर धर्म के बासठ अर्थों में से एक अर्थ देखिए तो नीति भी है न्याय भी है और दंड भी है आप देखिए न्याय नीति धर्म और फिर उसके साथ राइचसनेस भी है तो मेरा विचार ये है कि जो सर का जो टेक्निकल एस्पेक्ट है बेसिक स्ट्रक्चरल डॉक्टर ऑफ इंडियन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन when he juxtaposes it with dharma then he is trying to solve and address all those ticklish problems jo hamare body polity ko aaj lagi hui hai jaise ki majority minority ka ek issue hai bahut bada kashmir mein hindus majority hain hai minority mein unka genocide hua na supreme court maan rahi hai aur na india ki parliament maan rahi hai wo to kehte hain aapka hua hi nahi hai genocide aur isi prakar se ye caste conundrum jo hai jo sir ne itni important डायरेक्शन दिए हैं अपने उसमें मैं समझता हूँ एक वक्तव्य में एक व्याख्यान में इस प्रकार का इस प्रकार की स्थापना कर पाना क्या तो मैं आशुतोष जी को धन्यवाद देता हूँ कि हमें उन्होंने सर के इस लेक्चर से 
अवगत कराया और हमने उसको सुना धन्यवाद धन्यवाद सर जी आ, जी सर मैं सुधीर जी का बहुत आभारी हूँ और इस आभार के लिए सुधीर जी ने ही मुझे आशुतोष जी के पास पहुंचाया था <laughs> नहीं सर <laughs> नहीं, 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 नहीं सर नहीं सर एक विचार जो दिया है भूल है सुधीर जी ने धर्मा in fact this is what has not happened the problem which has arisen now here is and i am doing an another article on on secular state on an invitation from mumbai university they have asked me to contribute an article on on challenges of secular state and the indian knowledge system which is the theme which they have given now in that i found that hitherto in translating the term of a secular state first we have included in the english indian version dharma nirpeksha and then after we realized that no dharma nirpeksha is not it is the panth nirpeksha but on my analysis i found even even this terminology of panth nirpeksha which stands in the present constitution is not a right version it's wrong because you have to examine it from a different angle so therefore the debate now here is it's a kind of an irreversible but just like they say that they are not saying that we are from constitution se dharma ki taraf ja rahe hain do to begin with we said that ya to dharma se to jaya but wo wahi tak hi simit reh gaya uske baad hum aage nahi chal sake but now i think with this kind of an interaction it should possible for us बिल्कुल आपने मेरे मन की बात की कि एक बात हम इस बात को जरूर ध्यान दें कि धर्म से कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन और कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन से धर्म और इसके संबंधों को जरूर स्पष्ट करने के लिए प्रयास करेंगे और फिर दोबारा इस पे चर्चा जरूर करेंगे और ये होना भी चाहिए तो डॉक्टर रविंद्र जी प्लीज बी ब्रीफ एंड टू द पॉइंट ताकि हम समय थोड़ा सा बचा सकें पहले तो मेरे पास तो शब्द नहीं है प्रोफेसर के लिए प्रशंसा के बल्कि कहूंगा केवल आभारी हूं आ, एक दो जिज्ञासा ही है मेरी अशोक जब आपने शब्द समय प्रयोग किया तो सर से मैं जाना जो क्या मैं सही सोच रहा हूं या गलत केवल इतना ही है तो मिनरवा मिल केस में बड़ा स्पष्ट रूप से सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने कहा था That the basic structure of the constitution is based upon the bedrock of balance between fundamental rights and directory principles. So I understand that he is talking about the same thing. Second, when I was listening to you, sir, in the Swami case, Justice Sanjay Kaur has said very clearly that the concept of justice is nothing new to us. And then he had quoted the Bhagavad Gita, "Pritra na sadhu na vinasha cha dushkritam." तो जो आप कह रहे हैं कि अब अब कोर्ट भी मैं समझता हूं कि भारतीय दर्शन शास्त्र की ओर या भारतीयता के संदर्भ में निर्णय दे रही है इस बारे में मैं थोड़ा सा आपसे जानना चाहूंगा तीसरा सर एक और जब आपने अंत में कंक्लूजन में सर्वे भवन तो सुखीना की बात कही है तो ये भी बात मेरे को लगता है कि कहीं ना कहीं कृष्ण भारती केस में भी है सर जब उन्होंने ये कहा इस बारे में मैं मेरा निवेदन है आपसे की क्या मैं सही सोच रहा हूँ या नहीं थैंक यू सर रविंद्र जी you raised a very important point you see you see under the constitution and this is the 
kind of a tragic thing which has happened and it is taking place repeatedly. And what is that? Under the Constitution, the role of the Supreme Court is, and I may cite only one article, Article 141 of the Constitution, it says, the law declared by the Supreme Court shall be binding on all courts in India. It says, the law, not a law, the law. But the question is that if the Supreme Court itself is divided, and then we have to accept on the basis of majority and minority, does it resolve the problem, basic problem? The answer is no. It is not the law, because as I showed in case of Keshan and Bharti case, that those six judges in minority, they continually became later on chief justices and remained on the benches of the Supreme Court. Could they be denied by saying that the views which they have entertained earlier, they have to be just wiped out? The answer is no. Wiping out is possible only if there is a kind of a debate amongst the judges themselves. For example, in the present case which I have analyzed, three judges on one side, two judges on one side. My plea is, why don't these three judges and two judges sit across the table and resolve out why, why these the differences can't be resolved? Because this is the basic function of the Supreme Court under Article 141 of the Constitution. So all this confusion arises because of the multiplicity. And therefore, in multiplicity, how we derive unity, you see. This we need the role of the academician, and this is how we do in a Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Is Kibat Kisi Orka Koi Prashna hai, Koi or Tipani hai, Kisi ne Kuch Puchna hai, Kana hai, so Subhash Jadoji and again Ravi Sharmaji. So Pele Subhash Ji. मैं आप सभी महान बाहों को अपनी ओर से प्रणाम करना चाहता हूं मैं वो गांव का आदमी हूं जो आप सभी वक्ता ने कहा है कि उसको बेचारे को जब तक कानून से जो अपेक्षा है वो मिलेगा नहीं क्योंकि उसको जानकारी नहीं है कि संविधान की किताबों में क्या लिखा है हमारा पार्लियामेंट क्या क्या अमेंडमेंट करता है वो बेचारा पांच साल के बाद एक वोट देता है उसके बाद उसको पता ही नहीं होता है कि उसके पार्लियामेंट में किस दिन वक्त कानून ऐड होता है किस दिन शाबानों के सदाप होता है ये सब जानकारी तो आप वक्ताओं के पास रहती है जो आप अभी आप इसके चर्चा कर रहे हैं मैं तो वो गांव का आखिरी आदमी जिसको न्याय मिलता ही नहीं अगर वो इन सब सम्मेलनों को सुनता रहेगा और ये देखता रहेगा कि हम धर्म से संविधान की ओर जा रहे हैं या संविधान से धर्म की ओर जा रहे हैं उसको इससे क्या लाभ मिल रहा है क्योंकि उसको आखिरी किनारे पे तो कोई न्याय मिल नहीं रहा है अगर न्याय नहीं मिल रहा है तो हम इतनी बड़ी-बड़ी चर्चाएं करने के बाद किस मुद्दे पे हमारे प्रेजेंट चीफ जस्टिस ऑफ इंडिया उनको हमारे धर्म के साथ कोई संविधान में संहिता नहीं मिलती हम सिर्फ इसमें व्याख्या करते रहेंगे अगर हम व्याख्या ही करने पे रहेंगे तो हमारे पूरे भारतवर्ष में जो 1947 जब यहां पे एक लाखों शवों का कार्यक्रम बनाया गया किसने बनाया आप सभी को जानकारी है क्योंकि आप सभी मेरे से ज्यादा जानकारी है आपको पूरा धर्म और न्याय के बारे में पता है अगर हम लाखों शवों के ऊपर चलकर के आज 70 साल में यह सुनना चाहते हैं कि हमको अपने संविधान में बदलाव चाहिए क्योंकि एक ब्रह्मन जाति का आदमी आज रिक्शा चला रहा है और एक जिसको रिजर्वेशन मिल रहा है वो बंगलों में रह रहा है अगर ये हालत हमारी 75 साल में आजादी के बाद है तो फिर हम किस न्याय के बारे में किस संविधान के बारे में इतनी बड़ी चर्चाएं कर सकते हैं क्या गांव के उस आखिरी आदमी को न्याय मिल रहा है उसके लिए हम कोई देखना नहीं चाहते हमारे पूरे इस तंत्र में जिसको न्याय तंत्र कहते हैं अगर ये सही बात है कि हमारे जजेस एक कोलिजियम से आज तक 70 साल में प्रमोट होते रहे क्योंकि वो 3 400 फैमिलीज के मेंबर्स हैं तो हम किस न्याय के बारे में बात कर रहे हैं अगर आज के दिन में हम 5 लाख बच्चों को एक एग्जामिनेशन 6 लाख बच्चों को एग्जामिनेशन में बैठाते हैं उनको कहते हैं कि आप में से सिर्फ 1000 लोग एक एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव कार्डर में आ सकते हैं ऐसा एग्जामिनेशन जजों के लिए क्यों नहीं 
एक जुडिशल सर्विस क्यों नहीं है हम कोलिजियम के पीछे पड़े अगर हमारे पास एक आई ऑफिसर अपॉइंट करने के बाद कैबिनेट सेक्रेटरी बनने सर मेरा मेरा निवेदन है कि थोड़ा सा ब्रीफली इस बात को रखें अगर प्रश्न के रूप में मेरा एक निवेदन है आप मुझे अभी रोक सकते हैं नहीं 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 समय नहीं, 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 नहीं है रोक लीजिए नहीं मुझे रोकने में कोई आपत्ति नहीं मगर मेरा इतना सिर्फ आपसे भी ज्ञानवान हो गए मैं तो गाँव का आखिरी आदमी हूँ मुझे तो इसके बारे में आर्टिकल और सब आर्टिकल के बारे में ज्ञान इतना नहीं है लेकिन मैं एक गाँव का वो आखिरी आदमी हूँ जिसको न्याय चाहिए अगर सत्तर साल के बाद आप मुझे कहते हैं कि हमको संविधान से धर्म धर्म से सलमान मैं आपकी बात सुन रहा हूँ मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगा कि हमारे पास कुछ लोग अभी भी जागरूक है जो चाहते हैं कि धर्म जो है उसको अंग्रेजी में रिलीजन नहीं कहना चाहिए ये मेरे लिए बहुत बड़ी उपलब्धि क्योंकि कम से कम सत्तर साल के बाद हमें पता लगा कि हाँ धर्म का मतलब रिलीजन नहीं अगर ये बात सही है तो आप खुद एक आप खुद एक बात देख लीजिए कि हमें कहाँ से कहाँ जाना है क्योंकि 75 साल 70 साल आजादी के होने के बाद हमारा एक मेंबर पार्लियामेंट हमारी ही पार्लियामेंट में आके कहता है जय हमास वो फिलिस्तीन की जय नहीं कहता हमास वो आदमी हमारे पार्लियामेंट में बैठ करके डिबेट करता है एक इंजीनियर जिसके ऊपर केस लगा हुआ है कि वो कल तक जेल में था आज वो ओथ ले रहा है क्योंकि वो टेरिस फंडिंग कर रहा है अगर हमको ऐसा कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन चाहिए तो पता नहीं हम कौन से संविधान से कौन से धर्म की और कौन से धर्मों से मैं आप लोगों का समय लेने के लिए आभारी हूँ अगर आप लोगों को किसी जगह पे इस मेरी पूरी व्याख्या में कोई बात सही लगी तो प्रकार की उसको देख लीजिए अन्यथा नकार दीजिए कोई बात नहीं वो जो नहीं नहीं मैं आपको सही बताना चाहता हूँ मैं वो गाँव का आखिरी आदमी हूँ जिसको आदत हुई है पचहत्तर साल से हमें न्याय नहीं मिल रहा इसलिए आप लोगों से इतना ही दोबारा मेरा निवेदन है कि आप व्याख्याएं चालू रखिए लेकिन पहले देख लीजिए वो गांव के आखिरी आदमी क्या पचहत्तर साल की आप दे रहे हैं जी पार्लियामेंट में जाकर के एक एमपी नहीं नहीं प्लीज आप मेरा ये पूरा वक्त सुन लीजिए आज सत्तर साल आजादी के बाद हमारा एक मेंबर पार्लियामेंट जिसने कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन की ओथ ली है फाइलिंग के टाइम पे जब उसे पेपर भरे कि मैं भारत के संविधान में पूरा विश्वास रखता हूँ उसके बाद वो ओथ लेने के टाइम पे कहते हैं जय हमास और वो आज मेंबर पार्लियामेंट वहां बैठा हुआ है एक हफ्ते से उसको किसी ने डिसमिसल नहीं किया तो हम किस संविधान की बात कर रहे हैं जी 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 एक पॉलिटिकल लीडर को जिसके ऊपर 100 200 400 करोड़ रुपए का एग्जाम लगा हुआ है उसने आबकारी में कोई कमीशन लिया नहीं लिया मैं इसमें डिबेट नहीं वो तो लीगल स्ट्रक्चर क्या है वो आकर के पंद्रह दिन की छुट्टी कोर्ट से लेकर के पॉलिटिकल प्रोसेशन करता है ये न्याय कहाँ है और पंद्रह दिन के बाद आप फिर उसको दोबारा जेल में डाल देते हैं मतलब कौन से न्याय की हम बात कर रहे हैं पचहत्तर साल के बाद आप देख लीजिए जी ऐसा लग रहा है जैसे कि वो जैसे आप किताब हमने कभी लिखी ना जिसको हम एक मंदिर में रखना चाह रहे थे मंदिर ही नहीं है कहीं जिसमें हम कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन रख के गए थे कभी किसी टाइम के लिख कर जी आपकी चिंता से सर आपकी चिंता का मैं सम्मान करता हूं और महसूस भी करता हूं और ये मेरी भी चिंता है कि इस कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन को किस तरह से एक वेपन और एक शील्ड की तरह यूज करके लोग जो हैं अगर एंटी नेशनल लोग वहां पे पहुंच रहे हैं और वो उनको कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनली प्रोटेक्ट किया जा रहा है तो ये बहुत चिंता की बात है कि आने वाला भविष्य कैसा होने जा रहा है कि आप वहां से उठा करके बाई एयर उनको लेकर के आ रहे हैं उनको संविधान की शब्द दिला रहे हैं और दे आर सेइंग कि भी हम भारत के टुकड़े कर देंगे दिस इज नहीं नहीं मेरा एक चिंता विषय आप देख लीजिए मैंने आपको लिख करके अपना सारा सबमिशन भेजा था क्योंकि मैंने सोचा हो सकता आपके पास समय ना हो क्वेश्चन लेने के लिए आप एक पॉपुलेशन का पोर्शन देख लीजिए भले ही वो मिनिस्क्यूल हो आप उसको 1990 में रातों रात उनके घर जो वो 5000 साल से रह रहे थे जितनी हिस्ट्री रिकॉर्डेड है हो सकता दस हजार साल से भी रह रहे हो तीन दिन के अंदर 5 लाख की पॉपुलेशन को आप खाली करवा रहे और उनको आप सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑनरेबल सुप्रीम कोर्ट नहीं तो कंटेम्प्ट हो जाएगा बात बात करने में ही ऑनरेबल सुप्रीम कोर्ट कहती है कि आपके जी तीस साल हो गए जेनोसाइड का केस एक्सेप्ट नहीं हो सकता है तो कौन सी जुडिशरी मेरे पास कौन सा संविधान मेरे पास किसको मैं गुहार लगाऊंगा अब मैं 
ह्यूमन राइट्स के पास जाऊंगा यूएनओ के पास जाऊंगा कि भैया मेरा कोई जिनोसाइड सुन ले क्योंकि मैं कश्मीरी पंडित पिछले पांच हजार साल से कश्मीर में रह रहा था या दस हजार साल से रह रहा था कोई सुनवाई नहीं आप कौन से संविधान को हम लेना चाहते धन्यवाद आप लोगों का समय ले लिया बहुत बहुत आभार नहीं 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 बिल्कुल मैं आपकी चिंता का सम्मान करता हूँ और ये हमारे लिए एक बड़ा जो है वो प्रैक्टिकल एक समस्या है जिसका हमें उत्तर देना चाहिए लेकिन दो अभी लोग और हैं एक तो रवि जी की बहुत संक्षिप्त सी टिप्पणी और एक डॉक्टर मनदीप मित्तल जी सर वेरी वेरी ब्रीफ प्लीज सर ताकि डॉक्टर साहब रिस्पॉन्ड कर सकें जी रवि जी मैं थोड़ा रुक जाता हूँ डॉक्टर मित्तल को पहले बोलने के लिए जी जी डॉक्टर मित्तल सर मंदीप जी सर जी नमस्कार मेरी कोई टिप्पणी तो नहीं है लेकिन मैं थोड़ा सा जो इतनी आर्टिकुलेशन दी एक तो सारे ऑर्गेनाइजर्स को बधाई देना चाहूंगा और बहुत बहुत मैं अनलाइटेंड महसूस कर रहा हूँ बहुत सारी चीजें मुझे पता चली और एक थॉट प्रोसेस में आई तो एक श्रीमद भगवद गीता में एक एक वर्ष है इसलिए आपका मैं धन्यवादी हूँ कि आपने इतने सारे लोगों को इकट्ठा करके उनको एक, एक माला में पुरोया और डॉक्टर वीरेंद्र कुमार जी जो इतने एमिनेंट जूरिस्ट हैं जिन्हें कम, कम से कम जिनसे हम बीस बाईस साल से एसोसिएटेड भी है और उन्होंने बहुत ही अच्छे ढंग से सुप्रीम कोर्ट की जो इतनी अच्छी जजमेंट्स जो आई हैं उनमें से उनको एनालाइज किया और हमें एनलाइटन किया और जो बात अभी पीछे शायद मनोज जी ने कही थी एक डिलेड जस्टिस वाली तो उसके लिए काफी हद तक सरकारें और राजनीति नहीं हम लोग भी जिम्मेदार हैं मैंने इसके ऊपर पूरा रिसर्च किया है आई हैव माई ऑन दैट तो मैं मैं बस इतना ही कह के अपनी वाणी को विराम दूंगा और मैं आप सबका बहुत बहुत धन्यवादी हूँ खास तौर पे ऑर्गेनाइजर्स का जिन्होंने इतना अच्छा और इतना एनलाइटेंड जो टॉपिक है उसके ऊपर हमें कृतार्थ किया थैंक यू थैंक यू सर थैंक यू और किसी की कोई टिप्पणी जी मुझे लगता है रवि जी बस आप एक टिप्पणी करें तो फिर हम उसके बाद वैसे मैं चाहता था कि प्रोफेसर संजय झा और संजय कुमार शर्मा जी अगर वो भी या हरीश पुरी जी किसी और ने कुछ कहना है तो प्लीज आप कह सकते हैं इट्स ओपन हाउस डिस्कशन नहीं तो रवि जी के बाद जो है उसके बाद फाइनल कमेंट्स जो हैं प्रोफेसर वीरेंद्र जी के लेके हम इस बात को यहीं पूरा करेंगे जी सर रवि जी आ, कई कई आयाम थे मैं तो सर इतना सा कहूंगा कि ये बहुत इंटेंस और बहुत शॉर्ट पीरियड में हमको ये सब सीखने को मिला इसलिए प्रोफेसर वीरेंद्र कुमार जी को इन्हीं पक्ष को और थोड़ा आ, संस्कृति से जोड़ने के लिए दूसरा प्रयास और हम करें जल्दी तो अच्छा रहेगा लेकिन उस बीच में आ, इसमें कोई दो राय नहीं है कि जो जादू जी ने सवाल पूछे हैं खास तौर पे कश्मीरी पंडितों के वो मैं ये कहूंगा कि मैं भी यहाँ साठ वर्ष से अमेरिका में आता हूँ जाता हूँ इंडिया लेकिन रहा हूँ तो मुझे जो यहाँ पर होलोकास्ट जूश लोगों के साथ जो अन्याय हुआ है उस तरह का अन्याय कश्मीर में पंडितों के साथ हुआ इसमें कोई शक नहीं है तो जब यहाँ पर इतने वर्ष से ये अन्याय के बारे में बातचीत हो रही है तो वहां पर कुछ एक्शन तो होना चाहिए था सरकार की कमी है या जुडिशरी की या पार्लियामेंट की ये मुझे मालूम नहीं पर मैं ये जरूर कहता हूँ कि इतना बड़ा अन्याय बिना रखे किए नहीं रहना चाहिए ये अन्याय है दूसरी बात ये है कि दूसरी बात ये है कि धर्म का एक अर्थ और है वो विज्ञान की दृष्टि से हर एक पदार्थ का जो अपनी लाइफ साइकिल है एग्जिस्टेंस एंड विल है उत्पत्ति स्थिति और विल है हर पदार्थ की हर हर ब्रह्मांड के कण की ग्रह की नक्षत्र की तारों की 
तो वो धर्म की परिभाषा एक और अलग से परिभाषा जी दूसरी बात है कि सत्य तो केवल एक ही है जहां वो यत्र विष्णु तिष्ठति ऋग्वेद के हिसाब से वो सत्य है वो सत्य से भी वो बाहर निकल के आया है इसलिए तिष्ठति जो असली सत्य वो तो ब्रह्म है जो कि आ, जिसको फैदम नहीं किया जा सकता तो अलग उसका उसका अर्थ है एक लास्ट में पॉइंट कहूंगा संग ये सम वाला जो है दसवें मंडल का आखिरी संग संवदत्वम संभो मनांसी जानता ये डेमोक्रेसी का फर्स्ट प्रिंसिपल है ये मैग्ना कार्टा से भी ऊपर रखा जाना चाहिए ये अमेरिका के कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन से भी ऊपर रखा जाना चाहिए और अपनी पुरानी पार्लियामेंट के एक हॉल में ये लिखा हुआ भी पर तो मैं चाहूंगा कि सारे विश्व में डेमोक्रेसी कहाँ स्टार्ट हुई अपने ऋग्वेद से उसका इंडिकेशन मिलता है ग्रीक्स ने भी दिया हमने भी दिया और ने भी दिया होगा तो बस क्षमा चाहता हूँ आपको दोबारा सुनने की लालसा है और थोड़ी सी ये इंडियन कल्चर के पक्ष में और थोड़ा नेक्स्ट टाइम आप समय बस नमस्कार जी आ, सर ये बातें जो आपने कही हैं ये हमने फर्स्ट सेमिनार जब किया था व्हाट इज भारतीय इन इंडियन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन तो ये तब चर्चाओं में आई थी बातें और काफी विस्तार पूर्वक हुई उसके बाद और बहुत सारे इश्यूज आए तो जरूर निवेदन दोबारा हम करेंगे डॉक्टर वीरेंद्र जी से आपके इस आ, मुझे लगता है बहुत जल्दी ही आपकी ये इच्छा भी पूरी होगी क्योंकि और बहुत सारे विषय हैं कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन को लेकर के लेकिन समय की सीमा को ध्यान में रखते हुए आ, अब मैं निवेदन करता हूं प्रोफेसर वीरेंद्र जी को कि वो अपना जो कंक्लूडिंग रिमार्क्स हैं इस सारे विषय के ऊपर उन्होंने सबकी बात भी सुनी चिंता भी सुनी स्कॉलरली क्वेश्चन से लेकर के एक आम व्यक्ति तक की पीड़ा को भी उन्होंने महसूस किया है तो वो मैं उनसे निवेदन करूंगा कि ही शुड रिस्पॉन्ड टू ऑल दिस I think in my <clears throat> conclusion, only thing which I would like to share is that I am extremely grateful to all of you who have given me the privilege of listening and then providing legitimacy of whatever I have said. The kind of a questions which you raised, they have just really encouraged me, encouraged me to go more in this direction, which I might not have. Now, so far as the issues which have been raised, I think they were some of them were of prime concern uh, in relation to the amplification of the term dharma. The only thing is which has appealed to me, and because the Harish Puri is there with me specifically, I would like to refer to him. That we are looking at the functional perspective of it. You see, how do we? Look at the dharma functionally. Mm -hmm. Now, what and how it was expounded in dharma shastra? Very well important. It is important to understand the kind of a context you see. But in social sciences, unlike physical sciences, these ideas are to be created. You see, in physical sciences, you discover what it exists. In social sciences, you create a norm. You create a norm by studying in depth the human behavior, by understanding the human quality, and accordingly, then you try to derive the kind of a principle. It becomes scientific in the sense that whenever you formulate a proposition, it acts just like an hypothesis. Then you would try and examine, and then if this hypothesis turned out to be true, we say that it becomes a law. But still, it becomes a relative law. It is not an absolute law. Even in physical sciences, they also operate on the principle of relativity. But in social sciences, it is much more, much more intended. You see. Without it, you can't do it, because this. Is, that's why we say the constitution is a dynamic document. On the other hand, say it is inviolable, it is unchangeable. So therefore, how do we find? 
dynamism in in kind of a proposition which otherwise turned out to be static, you see. It is through exposition. Therefore, we say that in social sciences, at any given point of time, in any cultural society, we tend to stay at the stage of tending to become. Tending to become. Just like a tangent at any given point of time, you are changing at every moment, but you don't see that change visibly. So therefore, in social sciences, this also undertakes the same way. In fact, one of my teachers at the University of Toronto did tell me 60 years back. He said, in any kind of a generation in social sciences, the kind of a change which becomes apparent, he says, in any century, it's not more than 5%. Can you imagine this? Not in, it's not more than 5%. It's so gradual. It's so gradual. You cannot accelerate the process of testing, testing like in a laboratory that you go and test, you see. It is to be test with a long, long experience, you see. So I think phenomena in case of religion is that you perceive certain values, values which you define as a righteous course of conduct, and the values at a given point of time which you term the righteous course of conduct is your dharma. Dharma is not something something static, you see. So this is how the whole evolutionary process, this is how the whole constitution develops. Fundamental principles, this is the, this is the fundamental principle, we say Vedas are the prime source of law, paramount source of law, unchangeable. No, even these principles must have been tested and tried from generation to come, and then they took that kind of a shape. It is not created in a day. Similarly, when we gave to ourselves this constitution in 1949, do you think that we have created all this norm all of a sudden? No. We looked around, we tried to take the best out of from every generation, from every country, from every constitution, and the, our own experiences of the founding fathers of the constitution is a sum total of that, you see. Sum total of that. So, therefore, in fact, the person like Professor Radha Krishnan was there. Radha Krishna. In the concluding days, his Dharma is the king of kings. And this is how we defined the constitution. Dharma is the king of kings, which means the constitution is your dharma. It is the it is this. But then dharma is to be borne by the individuals. How do they carry out? That's why we say how how much perfect you make a constitution, but it depends upon those who have to work with the constitution. The best of the document can be can collapse, and the worst of the document can work out very well. Look at the instrumentalities, the institution which they have to work. As a teacher, I would say the sole responsibility, if his students are bad, it is not the responsibility of the student, it's the responsibility of the teacher himself. If teacher is bad, if students are bad, it's the reflection on the Teacher himself, but how, to what extent, we tend to go that way. You see. So in a constitutional level, we are talking at a larger dominion, a larger conversation. So it is this: if we say that something is bad, then it, is it not my responsibility to say why it is bad? And then is it not my responsibility that if it is to is some correction is to be applied, how that correction is to be applied? So it's a kind of a cumulative, cumulative attempt. You see. Probably this kind of a discourse which you are arranging under the ages of your institute, Institute of Applied Sanskrit and Education. I think this is the prime purpose of it, that we sit together, we take up a problem and try to see how in what manner it can be improved upon. That's the only basic thing. I think these are the only thing which I would like to say. And bear in mind the various questions. And the one mostly I feel encouraged that it seemed that I was able to deliver something uh, which may be of some value which you have to decide for yourself. And thank you very much. This is the only thing which I would ask. And thank you very much, Professor Puri. You have taken up time. And I do thank Justice Ashok Ban, Justice Anand Kumar. They did come. And after the conclusion of my lecture, 
they, they have left. Probably they were too tied down with their with their families. Thank you very much, Ashutoshi, for giving me this kind of an opportunity. धन्यवाद तो सर आपका है बहुत बहुत आभार कि आपने अपना समय दिया अपना ज्ञान दिया अपना परिश्रम दिया तो जितना हम आपका आभार व्यक्त करें वो कम ही है निश्चित रूप से और जितना हमें इस सारे विषय को विस्तार पूर्वक समझने का मौका मिला है और जो इंसाइट आपने हमें दी हैं वो सचमुच हमें एक ग्राउंड लेवल की से परिचित कराती हैं कि किस तरह से कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल थिंकिंग जो है वो ऑपरेट करती है और कैसे उसमें इश्यूज हैं और कैसे हमें उनको हैंडल करना चाहिए समझना चाहिए इस सब के लिए आपका हम धन्यवाद करते हैं आभार व्यक्त करते हैं और मेरा आपसे आग्रह रहेगा और जैसा कि पार्टिसिपेंट्स का भी था रवि जी का भी और लोगों का भी कि इस विषय को हम थोड़ा सा और अग्रसर करें निकट भविष्य में मैं आपसे चर्चा कर लूँगा जैसा जो विषय आपको उचित लगे और जिस दृष्टि से उचित लगे उसको हम इसको बढ़ाना चाहते हैं क्योंकि इस विषय को हमने अभी तक छेड़ा नहीं था ये पहला विषय था जिस पे हमने चर्चा की है आ, सुप्रीम कोर्ट को लेकर के अन्यथा अभी तक हमने केवल तीन लेक्चर जो किए हैं वो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन को ही किए हैं कि भी कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में भारतीय मूल्यों को देखने का प्रयास किया है उसके फंडामेंटल राइट्स और अपने जो पुरुषार्थ हैं इनके साथ इनका संबंध क्या बनता है या उसके सांस्कृतिक आधार क्या है इन सब विषयों पे हमने चर्चा की है तो लेकिन इस बात को हम आगे भी लेकर चलेंगे तो उसके लिए आपका हमें सहयोग भी चाहिए आपका आशीर्वाद भी चाहिए और आपका दिशा निर्देश भी चाहिए तो आज की चर्चा को हम यहीं पर पूर्ण करते हैं और आप सबका मैं धन्यवाद करता हूँ आभार व्यक्त करता हूँ इतने धैर्य पूर्वक आप सब लोग जुड़े रहे और चर्चा में भाग लिया और सारे विषय का विस्तार किया तो बहुत बहुत आभार धन्यवाद तो आज की सभा को यहीं हम पूर्ण करते हैं और विश्राम देते हैं धन्यवाद थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू एवरी वन बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक यू प्रोफेसर आई योर प्रेजेंस सो काइंड ऑफ यू Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashu, Ashu. Thank you. 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 Thank you.